right before COVID hit, which seems a lifetime ago now, we were able to get together for one more book club where we discussed sleep, negotiation, and personal development. Listen in to get another look behind the scenes at Nexus PMG and join us for our book club. Visually appealing. I got like handouts. Mm-hmm. Like that. I got nothing on this one. I mean, I'm, I'm got handouts too. Oh my <laughs> goodness. <laughs> Why? Well, I, I listened. I had the. Uh, I had the. I guess the uh, flexibility to, but I listened to the last recording, and you know when we were going back and forth, it was actually kind of entertaining, but it was all over the place. So I figured I was like, I'm gonna actually show up with a printout this time and some sort of like methodology to talk about it because the other thing we didn't really do is really address in the last one we all talked about our books but we didn't really hit home the topic which was and maybe we opened this one with that how does that how do we drive business around it how does that yeah we closed yeah, the yeah, book yeah, club with I it a little that. bit around we should get into cybersecurity, but yeah i, I thought that was well. um so with this one you know talking about i think uh, this is good because this has a tangible benefit to us yeah. in a business environment so, so yeah, today the topic is self-improvement but hired your brother right yeah, yeah, that's true. We didn't get one out of it. So yeah, self improvement and integration to business, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. You want to go first then? No. All right. Should Should we go first? I mean, we wrote the first year. Raj and I read the same book, so it seems that I am never going to get do my own book review. And I've read it, so I can wait. And you've read it. Um. I'll kick off. I mean, this the book's called Why We Sleep. It's by Matthew Walker. Um, who's a professor of neuroscience and psychology at UC Berkeley, um, world-renowned sleep psychologist, uh, sleep, what does he call himself, therapist or scientist? Like a scientist, okay. PhD. Yeah. He makes a point of spelling out that he's not mm. on the medicine side, he's on the science side, Research. which which is very um, very prominent throughout the whole book and something you do actually need to remember. This is not medical advice, it's, it's science. So um, that was really the key takeaway from the author and his background. Um, advise multi, multiple different groups from government through to private business through to, on um, the back it says 60 Minutes, BBC News. I mean, he's got sports teams. Sports teams, yeah. He's NFL, NBA. He's their sleep, uh, sleep uh, scientist and advises them on um, athletes' uh, sleep regimes and what's good for, for them on that side of things and best for recovery and best for performance. And, um, just a very knowledgeable kind of guy on the subject. I like to read the books by the people who actually know what they're talking about. And I did it last time. This guy's well-renowned, world-renowned on the subject. So um, that's a little bit about the author. Do you want to give a quick overview on what you thought, Raj? And I'll jump in as well. Um, and I haven't got many notes on this one. I'm, I've got a couple key pages where I, I'd like to read the 12 tips at the end for better sleep. Yeah. You know, why don't you read the 12 tips first? Start with that because that's a good conclusion and then we can kind of discuss it. Circle back. Right? Okay. So, I mean, it's the book's Why We Sleep. And it's, I mean, it's it's the benefits of a of good sleeping habits, good sleeping patterns, and I mean, there's there's a multitude. And the downsides to not having it. <laughs> downsides to not sleep, sleep hygiene, I guess. Right. Thing, right. So there's there's two there's two sections I really wanted to just actually read straight off the page. Just I felt like that was the best way to do this on this one. That was the conclusion of the book. It's called To Sleep or Not to Sleep. It says within the space of a mere hundred years, human beings have abandoned their biologically mandated need for adequate sleep, one that evolution has spent 3.4 million years perfecting in service of life support functions. As a result, the decimation of sleep throughout the industrialized nations is having a catastrophic impact on our health, our life expectancy, our safety, our productivity, and the education of our children. And those subjects right there are basically the basis of the whole book. And he kind of touches on each one in, in parts. This silent sleep loss epidemic is the greatest public health challenge we face in the 21st century uh, in developed nations. If we wish to avoid the suffocating noose of sleep neglect, the premature death it inflicts, and the sickening health it invites, a radical shift in our personal, cultural, professional, and societal appreciation of sleep must occur. Um, so his conclusion is three paragraphs, and it's bold. It's just sleep, like just sleep, get into a good sleep pattern. Um, and he follows it with 12 tips for healthy sleep. And again, I'm just going to read them out. It's stick to a sleep schedule, go to bed and wake up at the same time each day. Um, as creatures of habit, people have a hard time adjusting to changes in sleep patterns. Sleeping later on weekends won't fully make up for a lack of sleep during the week and will make it harder to wake up early on Monday morning. Set an alarm for bedtime. So instead of setting an alarm to wake up, set an alarm to tell you when to go to bed. And I know Apple have started introducing that on their iPhone as a feature to say, hey, it's bedtime 
get ready, like prepare you, turn off the blue lights and stuff like that. And it's, it's a big deal. Um, so I think it's getting some traction in terms of that tip actually being implemented into our lives in front of the one device we spend our lives on. So um, if there was only one piece of advice you remember and take from these 12, 12 tips, it should be that. Um, so that's really stick to a sleep schedule. Go to bed at 10, get up at 6, whatever. Get your eight hours and make sure you do it. Exercise is great, but not too late in the day. Try to exercise at least 30 minutes on most days, but not later than two to three hours before your bedtime. He talks in the book about um, your body temperature increase and not giving yourself adequate time to cool down. So that affects your sleep, that affects your sleep patterns. So exercising before, before dinner is probably a good, um, a good barometer for that. Avoid caffeine and nicotine. Uh, coffee, cola, certain teas, and chocolate contain a stimulant caffeine, and its effects can take as long as eight hours to wear off fully. Uh, I've actually changed a lot of, since reading this book. I've actually changed a lot of what I do. Uh, my last cup of tea, and I, I'm, I feel like I'm kind of ahead of the curve just drinking tea anyway, but my last cup of tea was usually two to three o'clock. Pulled that forward to 12 1. That's two. Um, <laughs> uh, no, no, for the audience, Paul is currently drinking a cup of tea at 2 p.m. It would have been an hour ago. We went out to lunch. Um, <laughs> nicotine is also a stimulant, often causes smokers to sleep only very lightly. In addition, smokers often wake up too early in the morning because of nicotine withdrawal. So caffeine is the one I relate to there. I mean, it's... it's yeah, Brian and I were talking about... I think I remember when you read the book. Yeah, have it's a bit too, right? Mm -hmm. I used to have an afternoon coffee, and I, I don't anymore. Did it, it does help. Did it affect? Okay. I really do. I feel like it helps. It may just be the placebo effect, but yeah, yeah. That's what was it? That? It's like a, if I remember, it's a twelve-hour or eight-hour half-life. Yep. Mm -hmm. Eight-hour half-life, which means it's sixteen for sixteen hours, it's still in your system. So even if you drink coffee at nine a.m., it's still in your system when you go to sleep. Yeah. Um, avoid alcoholic drinks before bed. Having a nightcap or alcoholic beverage may seem to help you relax, but heavy use of uh, heavy use robs you of REM sleep, keeping you in the lighter stages of sleep. So um, also impairs your breathing at night too. Uh, I've actually noticed that myself. If I drink a lot or drink before I go to bed, I'll either get too hot and sweaty or my heart kind of beats too excessively while I'm trying to sleep. You always have snoring. And exactly. <laughs> exactly. Dry mouth. And well, just, I was just getting old. <laughs> <laughs> it might be that too, but alcohol compounds that in that, can, in that case. Um I've been a big proponent of this for most of my adult life, which is avoid large meals and beverages late at night. A uh, light snack is okay, but a large meal can cause indigestion, which interferes with sleep. Drinking too many fluids at night can cause you to wake up and need to pee. So, um, yeah, I, I, my, my wife hates it. I flip the, the kind of traditional U.S. focus of having a, a light lunch and a big dinner. I have a big lunch and a light dinner. Uh, it helps me tremendously. I think it helps me. Personally, I think it helps with weight control, and I think it helps with um, a whole bunch of stuff. And I just generally feel better when I go to bed versus, uh, I mean, I still do it maybe once a week. I have a big meal, and if I go out to dinner or whatever, and, um, yeah, I generally don't feel as good after that meal going to bed as, as I do after going to bed after a light meal. So that's personally anecdotal, one of my, one of my key takeaways from this as well. Uh, if possible, avoid medicines that delay or disrupt your sleep. Some commonly prescribed heart, blood pressure, or asthma medications, as well as some over-the-counter and herbal remedies for coughs, colds, or allergies can disrupt sleep patterns. Um, not one that I know much about, but yeah, there's the the drugs, uh, medicines and drugs can, can affect your sleep patterns. Don't take naps after 3 p.m. Um, the author is a, a big advocate of naps. Um, Kind of talks about it a few times during the <laughs> during the uh, during the book, and I know you've been pushing sleep rooms and nap rooms then, so it might be it might be something about it. And it's it's a really interesting topic. NASA have been doing it; they're one of the pioneers. And the, the Koreans are huge on that too, right? Yeah. Well, Europe as well. Yeah. The Italians, yeah. Greeks, Spanish, Spanish yeah. they all take rooms. Uh -huh. What I found interesting too on that part was some of the correlation of the studies they did worldwide. Two two of them, right? One was. Um, Countries that have the highest work hours per capita are actually the sickest, right? Which is kind of interesting. So the UK, ones that Japan, Japan the sleep. US. And the second one was um, every year the two biggest sleep studies in the world naturally occur, and it's when daylight savings time happens twice. Heart attacks. And it's the num It's a massive yeah. spike and decline in yeah. heart attacks across all hospitals in the world on those two days every year. It's like this, and it's like that. 
so it, it's amazing to see the correlation. Even just one hour time zone, it's like a 20% increase in heart attacks the day after one daylight savings time and a 20% decline the day after the other direction when you wow. gain an hour. It's, they've been tracking that for many, many years. So anyway, that was just something I remembered when you were saying that. Uh, number eight, relax before bed. And I know this will be a, a key one to apply to, to us and to most people um, in the company and any company is don't over schedule your day so that no time is left for unwinding. I think that's super important. I, I personally have a rule that I shut off at nine o'clock. Obviously, it doesn't happen all the time, but nine o'clock comes, I'll shut down. Um, and then it's kind of that last hour, hour and a half before I go to bed. So I've tried up that late <laughs> <laughs> until June. Yes, <laughs> I, exactly, I imagine that's uh, going to change slightly going forward. But I, I try and make sure I'm done with work and laptops and things by nine o'clock and, and just turn off. Um, I feel like that's a message we can, that's low hanging fruit. We can just tell people to stop working until midnight. I don't think there's any value in it. I don't, the author goes into a bunch of um, studies of people that, are just pushing and pushing and pushing. If you're not relaxing and then getting the right amount of sleep, everything you're doing anyway is going to be wasted. You don't retain it. You don't process it. You don't store it and file it correctly in your brain. And Yeah, in fact, they said something. I remember there was a part in there, if I remember correctly, it was like the concept of college kids cramming and doing all-nighters is like the worst possible yeah. thing they could because yeah. it's actually completely counterintuitive to storing in their hippocampus and then yeah. transferring all those memories. They actually have complete inability to retain all that information because of that. That's so it's big actually big counterintuitive, but yeah. We talked about the cumulative exams. If so anyone's been to college mm. experience cumulative mm. exams, which is a, sh a crappy idea, right? Yeah. So why, and apparently he got real, he wasn't very popular when he wrote the letter in Harvard, yeah. the article in Harvard, because professors pushed back on him. But think about it, right? You start something in, let's say, September, and in December you have an exam on it. You're going to go back and try to remember everything that you learned. Why not break it up into you know small chunks to where people can actually absorb the information? And these, I'm finding it right now with my oldest daughter, where she has seven periods, but the teachers don't coordinate regarding homework or what they're learning. It would be so much n nicer if the system was set up to coordinate. Mm -hmm. that, you know, this is what we're teaching. This is what this exam schedule looks like, rather than everyone's their own person doing their own thing, because that's what leads to these all-nighters or you know, people trying to cramp for exams right. because there's no coordination between the teachers, the classes. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was, uh, in the UK, we have um, high school, six form college, which is two years. High school is up to 16, six form college is 17, 18, and then university is after that. And uh, I had this interesting kind of break in my first year at university. We uh, first year at six form college, uh, they changed the way classes were taught and, uh, and assessed. Um, at the end of the first year, we had like something like nine hours of exams in like two days to catch up on the whole year's worth of stuff. Whereas in the second year, they did exactly what you were saying. They broke it down by semester. So each each class had its own exam after a period where you didn't have to retain it for six months. And then it, it was kind of just an interesting um, transition period there, which kind of related back to this book where he said that's how he teaches his classes. So um, number nine, take a hot bath before bed. The drop in body temperature. Um, Helps you regulate your body. Your body, your body cooling down quickly helps you helps you sleep. I did a lot of separate reading on that one because of the heat shock protein and all the stuff I was talking about earlier. It was amazing to read some of the other studies from some of the, some other authors out there on just that specific niche topic on how incredibly valued it can be to have a huge temperature differential right before you go to sleep between hot and cold. Um, if you're interested, I'll send you guys some of the reading material I read, but. There's all sorts of different like enzymes and proteins and stuff that release in your body in those temperature deltas that actually correlate directly to like your adenosine levels in your brain and stuff to actually trigger deeper REM sleep. It's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. There's also uh, one of the recommendations earlier in the book was if you're having trouble in bed, tossing and turning, get out of bed. Yeah, and that was interesting. Kind of walk around, cool down, get some air circulating yeah, and lay there. Right. Otherwise, you're just going to spike. Minutes, so. I mean, I think he says something like that. Yeah. Um. Dog bedroom, cool bedroom, gadget free bedroom. Get rid of anything in your bedroom that may distract you from sleep, such as noises, bright lights, uncomfortable bed, warm temperatures, your wife. It doesn't say wife. Uh, <laughs> we were thinking it up. Yeah. You sleep. Because Natalie's not listening. Yeah, no. You're on fart. Out of here. <laughs> you sleep better if the temperature in the room is kept on cool side, TV, cell phone, or computer. Remind me again. I think I remember reading. It was something crazy. It wasn't it like 64 degrees or something like that? 65. 60, yeah. 65 degrees. It was it's cold. cold. I sleep at 70. Yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. In the last month, 
my whole family's like, why is it so cold in the nighttime? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> like, that's cold, though. Like, I'm not paying for the air conditioning. Well, that's a no. <laughs> I thought about that. I'm sorry. I thought about that when I read it. I was like, what happened? Mine's a 68. Yeah. That's cold as well. Like It is. Yeah. 65, though, is like. Hang meat in them. Yeah, that's cold. <laughs> yeah, that's cold. yeah, generally. I'll do in the hotel, but yeah, I'm not paying for that. But open, <laughs> like in the wintertime, if it's cool at night, opening up a window, right, you can. Yeah. That's how I actually put your heat on. That's how I cool the bedroom down. Yeah. Yeah. The window for you to see. Um, yeah. I mean, just making the bedroom your your kind of sleep sanctuary is is the is the theme. Get a comfy mattress. I mean, you, me, and you have talked about this a bunch in the past. Like, it's good to spend a good bit of money on a good mattress because you spend a third of your life on it. So, turn the clock space out of you so you don't worry about the time. Things like that. Just uh, I, I don't know if, if anyone watches TV in bed as well, but we. We kind of got rid of the TV in the bedroom and stuff like that. So just kind of make the t- make the bedroom a, a bedroom rather than a, a, a TV room. Um, have the right sunlight exposure. Daylight is key to regulating daily sleep patterns. So this is tough. Uh, back in the in the body of the book, it's kind of tough if you're working in an office and kind of getting out in actual sunlight is tough to do. But try and get out in natural sunlight for at least 30 minutes each day. If possible, wake up with the sun or use very bright lights in the morning. Um, Sleep experts recommend if you have problems falling asleep, you should get an hour of exposure to morning sunlight and turn down the lights before bedtime. And one of the interesting things in the book was that if you get what was it? If you get sunlight too early in the day, um, it's actually worse for you than getting sunlight later at say five. Because if you get it later in uh, earlier in the day, your body's expecting you to wind down by a, a, a set day. amount of time after you get that sunlight exposure. Whereas if you get it later in the day, you still got that set amount of time after the exposure. So it kind of prolongs your tired feelings. So uh, it kind of um, pushes forward your tiredness feeling. So it's, 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 it's an interesting way to say it. he says get more in the mornings, but also it's like if you get it too late and then you don't keep it up, you also kind of you'll be tired in midday. So, so it's a tough one. And I, I think it's secondary to some of the other recommendations on the list, in my opinion. Uh, oh, and one I just mentioned, don't lie in bed awake. If you find yourself self still awake after staying in bed um, for more than 20 minutes, or if you're starting to feel anxious or worried, get up and do something um, until you feel sleepy, something relaxing until you feel sleepy. So they're the, they're the 12 recommendations. Um, the book. While, while we're still on recommendations, one thing that might be valuable to you guys, and I think maybe some of you guys already do it, but um, Debs and I, Debs has been using it for a long time, but I started doing it with her. There's an app, an app that you can download. I think you have to pay for a service called Calm. I don't know if you guys have mm-hmm. ever heard of that. It's actually really interesting. It's um, British guy started it. Yeah, it, it's um, it sounds cheesy to be fair. It must be good then. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> My book was written by a British guy. Mm-hmm. What's happening? Um, but essentially they have what's called, they have different types of ways to help you get better sleep, but they have like meditation, they have like noise, different types of sounds, like forest sounds and all that stuff. But they have their most predominant thing that they, with their business driven stuff called sleep stories. And it's essentially you, it'll, it'll, you can set a timer so it tunes out, but essentially you're listening to a story being told. And the idea is with the sounds and the voice, like they hire people that to tell these stories like Matthew McConaughey and stuff like that, that have really like, what they call ASMR voices, right? That like help you go to sleep. But the idea is, is the voice and the sounds actually trigger brain waves to help you sleep. And at the same time, it also focuses you to listen on a random ass story about people, bunnies running through lavender fields. It doesn't really matter, but it gets you stopping to think about the daily worries of life and what you have to do at work the next day and all that kind of stuff. Um, and they have meditation as well, but Debs and I have been using it. I actually find it as corny as it sounds to be incredibly powerful. Um, you just put them on at night and it's not easy for everybody, especially those of kids and sometimes wife and husband go to sleep at different times. I was talking to Chris Hart about it. He has different sleep schedules. So, but, um, if you wanted to try it, it's actually pretty cool. Uh, I it it does work. Yeah. So, so you, you know, you brought up a point just now about kids and different dynamics in the house. And that is my biggest struggle is that, so he talks about in the book, changing the lighting out, like he said, led lights are the worst. They're even worse than incandescent. Mm. Now, we just went through a federal mandate two, three years ago, where all that, all the lighting going forward has to be LED. Yeah. So, do I walk around with the yellow glasses on? Do I put yellow glasses on everyone? You know, I put the lamp next to my bed, which is an LED LED lamp. Yep. You know, so from that perspective, which one or two takeaways and not getting hamstrung by everything else mm. can I actually put into practice? So, I go to bed around nine o'clock almost every night, which is terrible in the social life on the weekends because I want, I want to be in bed. And my wife wants to go out. 
Yeah. You know, what, what does that happen? Because I'm waking up at 4.30 on weekends too. Just my brain is wired that way. We have that. We have the kids schedule. We have eating schedule, no drinking. Okay, so life gets, you know, tighter and tighter, which is fine with me. But how do you adapt people around you? Mm. And something you mentioned before too, and not directly sleep related, but from a, let's say, community organization related. We talked about the environment and how things are changing in that aspect. And you said a certain generation has to die off essentially <laughs> before we start implementing some of the new things or it'll be easier to do so. We still have people around us all the time that say, you know, four or five hours sleep is okay. You guys should be able to power through this, work late at night, early in the morning. There's that whole generational shift in that. You mentioned 100 years is what he mentioned, right? Mm-hmm. So how do we navigate that aspect of that? I think it's cultural. Yeah, it's, it's, very, it's very, so very challenging too. And then cultural also from an Indian standpoint, like we go out socially, they don't serve dinner till 10.30. Mm. <laughs> so I almost always eat before I go. Mm. And my wife's like, you're being so antisocial. I said, look, I don't want to go out eat 10.30, come home and sleep one o'clock and then wake up 4.30. Mm-hmm. Not even once a week. That's not what I want to do. Yeah. So all these different cultural, social norms, we have to navigate to implement some of these you know, things that we're reading. It's right. really challenging. Yeah. But the, uh, maybe Paul, you can touch on it, but like, Reverse engineering why this book recommends these things is really the crazy part throughout most of the book, right? Like the correlations between the lack of sleep and not getting the sleep we're talking about with things like cancer rates. And and these aren't just like studies. He's just like reading books. Like they're doing like really, really significant global studies. Um, and like the one I mentioned with the, 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 uh, the study that happens every year, twice a year with the uh, daylight savings time it is pretty profound when you read this book. The, the structure of the book is pretty good in terms of how it, it it defines what sleep is. It defines why you should sleep. Defines what happens when you dream and what happens in the brain. And it defines what society, how society views sleep now, how it's traditionally viewed sleep, and things like sleeping pills keeping you awake, things like iPads and lights and things like that that we just touched on are keeping the, this society awake, this this age. Um, and then things like what what things what things are society doing that are right. So like I said earlier, NASA is implementing nap rooms. The power nap, the relabeling of the nap was very interesting. Yeah, yeah. The pilots, they couldn't call it something else. They had to call it a power nap for people to participate. Yeah, it was like the 80s kind of business ma- uh, manager, right. wasn't it? Everything was like a power nap, power tie. It was like that whole Manhattan Wall Street kind of Make a mantra show. to it. Yeah, right. exactly. Whereas instead, I mean, it, it's not really a power nap. It's, I mean, you, you really need to tone it down a little bit and actually yeah. make it more relaxing and kind of. But it was interesting to read that it was like, at least this particular author said, you know, so many people in our society is built around finding ways for to come up with the next diet for people because that's such a big part of health, right? People talk about how important it is for exercise and working out, but like no one talks about sleep mm-hmm. and it's just kind of the thing you have to just deal with. But like it is in his argument is a, thousand times more important than either of those so you think about the time spent on it as well i mean it's a huge part it's a third of everybody's life it should be um and that's not just sleep but quality of sleep right it talks about it goes really deep into some of the science behind like you know the rapid eye movement sleep and the non-rem sleep and like how you have different cycles and like what it really means for your body and like what it actually does for your memory yeah they now believe if i remember correctly there was a chapter they talk about they they're there's leading indicators in their research is showing that sleep could be the number one cause for Alzheimer's and dementia. So yep. Bill Gates heavily disagreed with that. Yeah, I saw that. He read this book. Yeah, he, he did. Like, I saw this on his list. Yeah, which was interesting. That's how I picked it up, and you told me you'd already read it, and I was kind of excited about this one. So. Yeah. Um, so that's that's kind of the overview. I don't know if there's anything you want to add. I've talked a lot. But just but... to your point about how it flushes out the toxins and yeah. the build up plaque. I just think that the idea to come away with one or two personal takeaways that I can implement in my life, I think. Even when, even the previous book, the, you know, the technology conversation, I think I like to walk away from a book saying, okay, I spent the time and the energy to read this book. Right. What can I do in my life now? And 100%. what am I already doing right, perhaps? He talked about something about at the point of 16 hours of how you need more thinking cycles to be productive. Mm-hmm. And that's something that I've been trying to implement for years now is where I'll tell people, look, Talk to me in the morning. I'd rather not make a decision post 5 p.m., no matter what it is, you know, especially if it's relatively important and not being forced to give answers or trying to solve something at time of night. Wake up in the morning, 4.35 o'clock, fresh attitude towards it. But from this book, I mean, um, specifically the bedroom thing, number one. My children, number two, like education is going to be a tough piece for me now going forward. I'm currently waking my 
younger two up at 6.30 in the morning than to be at school at 7.30. And I dislike waking them up every single morning because they are fast asleep. Mm. And my older one starts at 9, which is great because I wake her up at 7.30. She's fine. But they still, you know, they go through six years of this where I wake them up every single morning. And it's tough for me to see that, especially when you got, you know. You know it's wrong. Right. You know it's wrong. That's the hardest part. And that's kind of we, the narrative is woven throughout this whole book. It's like, how do you battle the cultural element, even with work, right? And I think when we go full circle to talk about in the spirit of what we're trying to accomplish, how do we put work policies or ideas in place after reading this, right? It's like, you know, the idea, I, I had like three or four that I thought of when I read this book and I'd, I'll throw them out there to, to kind of go through the, you know, to, to satisfy the concept of what we're talking about, how can we improve our work lives? One was, I think we have a lot of situations where our employees and stuff actually end up traveling and sometimes their flights are delayed and they get home super late at night, right? We kind of, the general work culture in this world is you got to be in by seven, right? It doesn't matter if you get home at two or you get home at nine or if you have an infant child and you're up and you've slept four hours, we're actually not getting the best out of those employees just because they're here. You've got to focus on, are you getting the best version of themselves while they're here? Because mm -hmm. a six hour high performing employee is better than a 10 hour performing half drunk which is what he talks about in there. It's basically like being half drunk when you're asleep. But that was terrifying, by the way. Yeah, it's the equivalent of having like a 1.2% blood alcohol content if you've black only gotten like five or less hours of that sleep. That 18-wheel of, of function. That Buick Regal and the crazy. Life, that was really... And they had like all these, yeah, they had all these different like studies they did. You could probably... Course, yeah, I mean, you know, with young kids, you're about there. I mean, those first, quite frankly, year and a half is... You just feel fucked all the time. <laughs> Yeah. Like, Brutal. quite frankly, yeah. it feels like every morning is you're groggy, you're drunk, you're, yeah. I mean, it, 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 I believe that. I mean, so my, uh, my thought was two things you can do. One is I think we could put some sort of policy or name, even it's not a formal policy or, or it's a, some sort of guideline where when our employees are traveling or if they have super late nights specific to work, they should notify their management team and their management team should be encouraged to say, come in, you can still work from two to eight or if you need to work a shorter day but we should encourage people to sleep especially if they're traveling for our benefit from a work perspective mm -hmm. i remember one time you said you got home at like midnight or one from your drive back and you know i said to you sleep in mm -hmm. right and i wasn't just saying that because i felt bad for you because it's the right thing to do for yeah. you and for the business um we didn't care about you. We just it was no, like, no, the right thing for the business. It was like an absolute right thing for the yeah. business. Yeah. if you're not performing then yeah. you're just useless. um but so that would be one, and even just generally educating our employees on this type of stuff. Yeah. But also, I, I again, I'll go back to it, but I think a sleep room is something that's becoming more common. Um, Brilliant. Did you just think of that? I just thought of that. <laughs> really great idea, Ben. But uh, <laughs> I love that I actually didn't know that was a thing, though. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take credit for that in my own brain. Um, but I think we should consider, whether it's here, Greenville, all offices, is – to encourage people if they're tired and exhausted, if they have infants, to not feel ashamed to go and lay down for half an hour at lunch or during the day if they don't have a meeting for an hour, because they're going to be more productive in the time that they're awake anyway. If they need to come in a little bit late, work late, like the flexibility. I, I love the idea. I mean, quite frankly, I mean, I, there's been a couple times I even leave the floor. I go like, I'm gonna go close my eyes. Oh, you going on the, on, the, on the toilet? Oh, you just on the toilet. Shut <laughs> the door. That's what made me think about. Where you're like, let's get a sleep room in the office. Like, all right, yeah. But toilet bed, bed. Toilet bed. A lot of this is a cultural thing at the company. Like, you don't want it to feel like when people are going. You embraced like, it. Ah, oh, you're sleeping. What are you doing? Like, you actually want to encourage it and embrace yeah. it. To your point. Right? Over. It's, an, it's actually a food over. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Is that room for me? Well, let's be honest. We talked yesterday. You need to play about bunk bed. You need a bunk, bunk bed. Right? Yeah, we, we talked about bunk bed. We're bunk bed on this. Yeah. Bunk bed, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Custom made bunk bed. Be a busy sleep room. We're all going to be in there. Everybody's right? in there just napping together. I've napped in my car so many times. Yeah, me too. Yeah. 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 But it's because you feel like you're you're doing something wrong, right? Yeah, Which is yeah, just, yeah. It makes no sense. Demonized, yeah. Yeah. And so Especially in the U.S., and that's what they say in the West, in the U.S., in industrialized countries. It's the, Everything's about the work culture. Like work, work, work. But shift yeah. work. Yeah, yeah. Well, shift work is like the worst so, thing so ever. My dad did shift work yeah, my for dad many did. years. And, you know, I look back at his parenting style and short-temperedness and, love, and like, I can literally, like, tie those things together now. Mm. Yeah. Because you get paid extra for doing night shift. Yeah, yeah. And a friend of mine whose daughter just recently graduated, has become an RN, does night shift in Irving. And I told her, I said, she's 23, 24 years old. I said, are they paying her more to do night shifts? She goes, yeah, they still do night shift bonuses. I said, tell her it's not worth the extra money. She's 23, because it's about reproduction cycles and everything else, mm -hmm. tied to sleep, hormones. I said, tell her it's not worth the extra money to go do go to a night shift as a nurse. No, yeah. it's not worth it. Yeah. 
Well, now there are uh, the countries that are now paying people back, right? There's in Norway or somewhere oh, yeah. where the government's actually paying people back for, because they had to work night shift during a certain time period. Really? Uh, That's interesting. One of the other key takeaways, I think you and I have spoken about this before, uh, version is um, uh, sleep. Like if you get a bad email or you get a bad uh, mm -hmm. something happened to sleep on it. Yeah. Sleep on it and come back tomorrow. And there's the science behind it is your body sleep, you, you sleep and your brain kind of wipes away the emotion of the situation and then you come back at it tomorrow and it's just facts. And that's yep. the easiest way to deal with anything, anything that invokes a, a massive, even positive or negative reaction in a business environment, take it away, sleep on it. And your, your brain actually yeah. throughout the dream process and the, and the regeneration process will help you wash away those, that emotional side of it and come back and address it in a more professional way. Yeah, that's, that's, that's been a big learning for me. Cause I mean, I'm definitely a hothead. Everyone knows I'm and, kind and of a hothead in that. The environment we work in is quick. It's responses. Yeah. Is I'm available. It's got to be quick. It's not necessarily right. I mean, it's. But I think that works in relationships too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. I feel sure. like when something happens, I, I try to walk away as often as possible. Yeah. Go away, sleep on it, come back. Let's discuss it at a later time when yeah. emotions detach from it. That's right. And the number one thing that irritates you is you don't want to talk about it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> exactly, right. exactly right. I'm like, you know what? <laughs> yeah, we'll talk about it tomorrow. We'll talk about it. the bunk bed. Yeah, yeah, I'm going to sleep for him. But I thought that was a big one because like some some days like I get a client email and it's it based, my, my reaction is often like, go fuck yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I just need to step away. And yeah. it's usually a good yeah, factual no. response. No, yeah. no, we're going with the Colton. <laughs> There's usually a good uh, a good factual response that just brings it up a level, and often is on the other side of that coin as well. It's a it's an emotional reaction from the person sending you the email that makes you react emotion. Mm -hmm. yeah. So it's this chat. chain of emotional reactions. If everybody just stepped back for a minute, talked about a goal on a call or something, and just took all the emotion out of it, it would be quickly yeah. resolved. So there's that there's that chain. It's everyone else as well as just you. So it's super interesting. So I've kind of been listening. I found this really interesting. Did one of the things, and you guys all, pretty much everyone around the table knows this, you know, we I've been doing more of the uh, uh, restorative yoga, right, and trying to focus more on the meditation. Did they talk at all about kind of just peace of mind and meditation, yeah. or was it heavily around sleep? No, there was quite a bit for the quality of sleep yep. around meditation. Not necessarily about, it doesn't help you get necessarily more all the time. For some people it does, but it talks about getting you, your brain focused and primed for a deeper sleep, um, which is kind of interesting. But, and... Uh, and interestingly enough, part of that calm app, right, is part of that. But um, one thing that I was I found interesting that uh, Sushant does with his company is uh, one day a week, and maybe we do it less frequently. He actually has a, a yoga, like a restorative yoga and meditation instructor, actually come into the office and run a one hour class. I think he does it every Monday morning before they start their week. Wow. Something we could consider over time, maybe not right away, but if people, for those that want to do it, right, you could actually implement something like that. It could be a future endeavor for the business, but might be something we capture in our values off, you know, in terms yep. of things we could potentially influence later on. Another one was, um, um, and I don't think we can do this officially. It's not like we can force people to do this, but maybe it's some sort of educational element, but we should try to push um, some sort of internal learning environment around not having caffeine after lunch and not like endorsing our employees just sucking down coffee because they're, because they're already tired to try to stay awake or to keep them going. Right. And I don't think you can say no caffeine in the office afternoon. I don't think that's reasonable. Right. But I think you can put some sort of educational piece out there or have the office manager or something constantly be, you know, Hey, don't, you shouldn't, you know, drink water and say like something, I think the water machines will help give them an alternative. Like we should try to figure out something to try to push less caffeine, you know, after that morning coffee, if you will. And I want to go back to the meditation piece. Um, I know something that helped me over the years is, keeping a journal near the bedside because if I do have anything ruminating in my mind, I'll journal it out. I also keep a gratitude. I also do a gratitude journal every night. Help. I consciously prime myself with different thoughts before I go to bed. So one is the gratitude journal that I do, <clears> three <throat> things that I'm grateful for. And then I have this quote that says, um, focus on what you want or what you fear or what you're concerned about essentially. And so I prime myself at nighttime to go to bed with that thought and it helped me every single night I do it. Who was the inventor? They said that was a case study. Was it Edison? Edison had and, a free field and a journal. Yeah. yeah. And the app and yeah. Sure yeah. yeah. Drop them right and then, in the last book I read. Okay. Yeah, going going to bed with an intention, like if you have something you're trying yep. to solve, like yeah. go think about that. You say dreaming helps that that's what we're talking about. And yeah. then go to sleep. And it's apparently it's it's huge. It's like scientifically yeah. proven that that's a way to solve problems. That journal piece I feel helps with that meditation in my time. 
And my problem with journals, I can't read my own handwriting. So <laughs> it's not. It's not. I'm just kidding. It's not to go back and read though. That's the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I follow. Up. Yours could even just be to keep the screen off, but just record yourself. Well, it's it's also a good note in terms of rather than if if you can't if you've been working on something all day and you still like you're gonna go to bed and it's like still playing on your mind that's not a bad thing like mm. if something's taking you all day to figure out and you still can't get there just sleep on it and you're likely your brain will clear it up and get you there tomorrow kind of thing so I think a few, a, that when I read that a few of the people in this company came to mind about working on shit till midnight that yeah. that don't necessarily need to do pick no, it up and you'll be it's actually gonna hurt you. Exactly. Right. Yeah, and, that's the actually, irony of it. And I'll touch on that bit a little bit more, but like the, one of the things in my book that they talk about is like, like deadlines almost 100% of the time can be missed. Yeah. Yeah. Like, we need to treat deadlines stuff. like it's mm-hmm. like the end of the world. They're arbitrary. Half the time. They're arbitrary. Yeah. Right. Like most people will tell you quality matters way more. Right. So a thought out answer, uh, and this is Jimmy's big thing with one of the things he's irritated around with emails is back in the day when you was all handwritten letters. Right, and they had to respond to a – back in the 80s, you'd have time to think about your response. You'd have to type it up. With email, it's like you, you, you're, you like, forced to respond instantly, and you may, may not be the perfect, most well-thought-out response in that moment. So – but I'll, I'll reserve any more commentary. So on how that. do we want to capture these ideas as we go around and who's going to implement it? Should we put some, like, action items behind this stuff? Or well, we can put it into the framework. With the well, yeah, I mean, we're recording, so that's one way we're kind of yeah. – yeah, and sharing it, but I mean, like the sleep, like any policies or. Anything. So it's sort of framework. Yeah, yeah. I, I think a lot of this for me was the idea was the core values. Now that we've established yeah. that, was to so dovetail yeah, this with the. Yeah. So try to capture as much as we can. Yeah. I mean, some of it also won't fit the core values. Like you bullet, you're responsible for the notes because you're the best note taker around the table. <laughs> well, then I'll just be writing all the time. That's okay. Now, we'll we'll take going to Raj. That's good. <laughs> Think of it as journaling. Just the yeah, action, journal, item. action <laughs> items. Journal, action items are only. You're not writing, you're, 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 you're journaling. <laughs> the only one that came out of the last one is we want to be in cybersecurity. So. <laughs> yeah, I already got that one rolling. Um, okay. That's cool. all I've got on that book. It was excellent. It's a really, I would say that. It's in my backlog. Or definitely go read it. I highly recommend it. I just wish more people would take it seriously. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, it's. That's you, my biggest thing is it. Yeah. You can't just read it and go, that's interesting. You have to live. That's one you live by. Yeah. Like, you have to try to live by it. People that you live with would take it more personally, too. <laughs> yeah. Because my wife's on her phone until she goes to sleep. Yeah. I'm guilty of it. Well, I've, started, I've started locking my phone in a drawer, actually, two hours before I go to bed. Yeah. Wow. I see the only way I could I, I, check myself for myself, I that, man. I was in the eyes. I've been doing it. And it's better for my relationship. Inside that surgery. Like, Deb, Deb and I will just check it in a drawer at, like, seven, just shut it completely. Like, that's it. I do eye masks. My kid do I my kids do eye masks since I had the same surgery. Yeah. That's been eight years cooling the bedroom down, but the phone as a businessman, all I'm thinking about is okay, how can we monetize sleep? <laughs> <laughs> Let's go build an app or something if we're on that's the if we're on the early that's on the a, early that's adoption that's curve. Half billion dollar company. Yeah. Yep. I mean I think about all the stuff from our culture that's now like ghee and stuff is like normal is like we could have monetized ghee like back in the day, man. <laughs> like we needed to just do something with sleep. <laughs> Yoga sleep. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. So many sleep hotels somewhere and sleep pods in the airports, let's do it. Yeah, they have them. They uh, oh seen, they do, I've uh, seen them I've right, seen yeah. Far east, yeah. I think there's one at DFW in the international terminal too. Oh, there is? Okay. So that little shoot, you can just see them in Korea, somewhere like that. All right, who wants to go next? I think I'll go next because right. it seems like some of this bleeds over um, okay. into uh, what I read, and it was a recommendation from Raj, the Indistractable uh, by uh, Nir Yal. And um, the key, I mean, he walks you through uh, what distraction is and traction versus distraction. There's a few different elements that really kind of change the framing of my perspective of being so critical of my kids having technology in a lot of ways, which was big for me because um, I have a lot of reservations about it, but it made me kind of look into it and change my perspective more about the intent behind it. A lot of these books, the theme is being more intentional about what you do and just thinking about like those decisions you make. We make decisions every day, but not necessarily with that focus and intent that we, uh, that we should. It's just, you know, secondary. It's what we're typically going to do. It's a habit more than an intentional decision. So um, I'll just walk kind of through notes that I took on the book. On, on the, book. Um, the, the first, he, he talks about uh, the superpower of being indistractable. Um, 
and and traction versus uh, distraction. Either things are taking you away from what you want to do, or you're gaining traction and they're getting you closer to those goals. So recognizing that and figuring out a way to to encourage that in your life and what those triggers are is the key. Um, and so, uh, I mean, even listen to it, I was thinking somewhat from like a Terry perspective about unplanned and planned maintenance and root cause because the next uh, the next goes into your motivation. And it's more like, I mean, having a sequential plan for going through your life almost. Like we, we make these operational frameworks for plants and operations. You are that operation and we don't manage ourselves the same way in a lot of ways. Um, so it's like, uh, what motivates you? Um, going to the root cause of things um, that really drive your decisions. And uh, most of the time, and this he touches on in tech later on, um, if, you, if you have a child or if you're, if you're getting distracted often, if you're going and looking for other things or you just find yourself, you know, going and looking on Google or whatever, whatever you're doing, your kids are watching TV five or six hours, usually there's an underlying reason for that it's usually pain that they're hiding or some problem that they're hiding that they're getting away from we naturally try to try to get away from pain and so we look for distractions to do that and we don't recognize it because it's become such so ingrained in our lives that it is a distraction but if you can recognize that then maybe there's bigger issues there even for the kids i mean from my perspective it gives me somewhat of, of a trigger to know you know is there something that i need to talk to them about if they're ignoring me and like so ingrained in something else that they're really not that engaged in it's a distraction of something. It's a distraction of a bigger picture problem um, that you can recognize just by noticing that, but it's being intentional about trying to notice those things. Um, he goes through uh, time management versus uh, pain management and psychological factors, uh, boredom, negative events, rumination, uh, is replaying over and over uh, self-critical thoughts of uh, being overcritical of yourself. Um, hedonic ad ad adaptation is um, when we readapt the levels of happiness in our life based, based on our experiences. Uh, kind of like if, uh, if you hit the lottery, somebody that has experiences happen to them, they just won't find as much happiness. Or it's like, you know, an addiction and somebody has, they're always seeking more because our happiness levels adapt over time. So recognizing that and just trying to, trying to recognize um, the distraction and the way we can drive and motivate change from those. Like if you recognize your happiness changes and then you can change that and have more control over it. Um, turn your values into time was another one. Um, he talks about time. Be, I mean, out of all the, all the things in our lifetime would be the most valuable that we don't really see as that as often as we should, I guess money, all these other things you can make up. You can't make up more time. Um, so use that recognition um, to plan your life and plan your days and be more Sleep intentional. Be, be intentional about the time you use and plan it out. Um, you, your relationships and your work are like the three main things that there are in life. So if you basically it gives you kind of a framework and a structure to plan those things out. Um, and he has a lot of PDFs and things on indistractable.com. He mentions uh, not so much to plug in, but just as a, as a resource to go to that help you to kind of be intentional about the way you're planning out things. Um, they talk about taking care of yourself and, and sleep, hygiene, um, all these things help you to perform better as well. But it's that intentional ignoring the distraction of it. Um, scheduling important relationships, and I started doing this, um, and he talks about residual beneficiaries, uh, where I mentioned to Ben like two months ago, um, after we work so long during the day, and we're so focused, so ingrained in what we're doing, at the end of the day, we don't wanna go home and give our family just what's left over. And, the, and then they become the residual beneficiaries of that. Um, so. I've made it a, a point to at six o'clock. I have an alarm that says, you know, go talk to your kids, spend time with the kids because we put them in bed around 730, 830 uh, whenever we can. So it's like, go have conversations, disconnect from everything, have a conversation with them, you know, ask some questions that you wouldn't typically, but spend that personal time, um, not just watching a show together and things like that, but really try to get engaged. 
uh, with the family. And so that's that's been an intentional change that I've made that, that, that they talk about that I, I kind of agree with. Um, he shifts then to uh, somewhat to work um, and just the different elements, different hacks you can do uh, syncing with the stakeholders at work. Um, there are some things that I think we could do um, that might help as well. Um, but clarifying expectations inside and outside of work around schedules. We talked about some of that with the why we sleep. Um, just talking about at nine o'clock you can turn off or setting expectations around um, daily schedules, time blocking schedule. If people have a big task, um, maybe a routine to set for teams is, you know, have a Monday meeting every week and go through your schedule and figure out how you're going to execute the week so that everybody knows what the plan is. Um, and they talk a lot about time boxing schedules and have time boxing schedules um, a resource for that as well. Um, What's that? You do that? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I, I set out, I mean, I've been doing for a long time. I'll set out a priority list um, during the first of the day, but time time boxing is time good. boxing is more intentional than that. Time boxing is really hard for for our for what we do. It's not a thing to do. It's almost it's impossible. So many things you try to do at the same time, and it's like you're putting sixty percent into everything because you have so much to do, right? Rather than focusing an hour on this, an hour on this, and like not allowing yourself to just against the yeah. against the book, right? To be distracted from the primary task. I just don't know if it's possible. I mean, I've I've had I just it's it's almost at the detriment of certain things. I just I don't know how you do it. It's easier if you have a set. If you were on a set schedule for like one project, but if you're working different things, it's so hard to time box what's going to change in your day. Well, it you ties need to adjust to. it ties a lot into expectations, right? Take for example, if you're working on writing a report and you got to write the report. And you're sitting down and writing it. Things you can do like close your email, right? Like turn don't message. allow your like, email. yeah, or turn your phone over and yeah. close your or put your phone on silent. Turn your email because as soon as you get an email and you go, oh, Michael Dornfeld just emailed it. You have to sit there and you have to yeah. you want to respond to it. And then somebody sends you a team message. You respond. Then you're just you're writing. And I I'm guilty of this. I'll write like Real three sentences in a report and then I go back to teams and yeah. I write the next paragraph of the report and then I go back to an email. And you actually are way underperforming. So it's trying to time box, but setting the expectation with your client that you're not going to respond because as soon as you respond to your client's email every time right away they're going to start thinking that's how you're going to respond from there on out right so time boxing can be it can be if done properly in certain elements a big part of it's it's it's, 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 a, it's a fine line i mean this is coming from the same group that is effectively preached to our yeah. team that our quick responses is and our how it is our differentiator yeah, so it it's easy to say but at the fine same right time balance, it's right it's it's that value proposition that no one else can offer right now in the market that we can. So it's it's quite yeah, difficult. You gotta find the right balance. So yeah. yeah, it is a it related is. book, that deep work book. Yeah, Cal Newport talks about the Pomodoro method, which might be more effective. He said, um, research shows that your brain can only be engaged on one task for about twenty minutes or so. So in the Pomodoro method, hmm. you set a timer for twenty minutes. The time box so shorter. So, so you get two working sessions per hour, two twenty minute sessions, and the other twenty minutes is a break. So 10 minute break in between, answer emails, answer text messages, do whatever, but being able to allocate that 20 minutes that towards sense. that one task. That seems more achievable. Yeah. Ex exactly, and so Cal Newport, and that's what I use a lot of time. So I don't, I've never liked Slack or synchronous, asynchronous conversation or Teams or anything like that. I turn, all my notifications are turned off. Even on my computer, my dings and my bings, everything's are turned off. Mm. If I want to concentrate on something, I shut everything off, go to that, because I say to myself, look, it's only 20 minutes. Yeah. And so I use Last of the Mohicans on replay, from music perspective, you, da, 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 you hear it keep going for 20 minutes. It's just 20 minutes. I can do 20 minutes. And then go away, do the messages, come back to it. That helps you. Um, that's it's, it's been doing that for years. It helps you get over barriers of jobs being too big or too hard. It's just 20 minutes, right? You, you break you're doing for 20 minutes. Yeah, if you break yeah. a big, big job, so that had, that's, this phrase is how, how do you eat an elephant one bite at a time, time right? Yeah. So it's you break a huge task down into smaller chunks. And it's there's no mental barrier there. You just start. They, and and when if you do it enough, the tasks just seem like menial. It's like this is not hard. Like one paragraph here in a in a weekly report. It's like okay, I, and I do it with the monthly reports. I used to, and that's I think that's kind of how I got into it was. I've, like, I've got these 20 sections to do, and it's a 60-page monthly report, and it's like, holy shit, that's a lot of work. Well, it's really not. It's one table here for safety KPIs, then it's a cost table, and it's, you start piecing it out, and it's, it, it helps you really get over mental barriers. On, on I read the same way, too. Mm -hmm. I'll put the Kindle up 20 minutes. Just read 20 minutes, 
yeah go away yeah so that's part of the part of the next section which goes in was a big part of the business benefit i think of the book that i captured was the hack back and the hack back on interruptions um email and he goes through group chat um real methodically and so like we touched on uh, the teams or whatever it is i think a general theme that i captured that would be good for nexus potentially is setting guidelines around how to use the different communication programs because i've even found myself like um in some of the different assignments i work with like sending a document through teams and then not being able to find it in my email whenever i was looking for it because you know it's just things are lost in different places we have so many places to go it's like or was it in did i put it in the teams folder in the group, it. or did i email that like so i'm searching for a doc is it on you know yeah is it in my share folder what not it would be good to have kind of a guideline around that and kind of frame that so that it's it just kind of helps organize the company as a whole on yeah. where things go or what to do um we should be emailing live docs there's the rule. Yeah. <laughs> it should yeah. be saved on the drive. There's our general principle. If, well, if, 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 email email is, if your like, email isn't a PDF, it should be emailed. Exactly. Yeah. We mean, our files, our live files should be on a drive that anyone can access. Yeah. And nobody should, so one thing, nobody should have anything on that desktop either. It wasn't in this yeah. book I read, but in a different book I read recently, there was an element that plays off of that that could be even a like a implementation concept, but it was alongside the sleep room was actually an iso they call it like an isolation room but it's basically the argument was when you're sitting in your office you're going to come in and say oh i just got off the phone with so and so you're going to do it you're going to come over i'm going to get messages i'm in front of it but you can actually take you can actually take a you can put like a, a Saturday station station computer that has no connectivity yeah. other than just work like maybe there's no communication there's no teams on it it's just word and access to SharePoint or whatever, and you can go and sit for 20 minutes in that isolation room with a computer that has no access and shut yourself off. From yeah. yeah. No, and I guess we do need that desktop. We just yeah. we didn't need yeah. it. <laughs> so basically, it's a spare office, but it's a non-connected spare yeah. office that's for anybody to go in that needs to concentrate. And when you're in there, it's kind of like, like you are with a podcast. You don't go in. Okay? Yeah, no. Like you he, let that person focus. Yeah, he, he talks about signs, like even make signs that say, I'm busy, you know, yeah. executing this right now. Don't bother me. Like, there's not disturb there's, signs so that when people are working and really focus and need to focus in, they can have just something simple as a sign that would give everybody a notion that yeah. they need to be, they need to have their time then. And, and then you can come like or schedule a time, of, you know, maybe at the last 10 minutes of the day or first 10, 10, that's when you're available. But let everybody know that those they are do the it on times. trains, like in Europe, they have and like quiet, quiet rooms. zones. Yeah. Like it's for that purpose, right? Because then you, if you can't talk and you're not as distracted, you can't be on your phone. Yeah. You're more likely to be engaged with whatever it is you engage with. And Greenville had a rule like this in their open concept floor plan, which actually I think is borrowed from like co-working spaces. But if you have your headphones on, you don't disturb that person. Yeah. yeah. Right? Because they have an open floor Full plan. Full headphone, there. one headphone, no headphone. Right. Yeah. yeah. So like Greenville right now, if you got your headphones on and you're working, you don't disturb that person. Right. I mean, our version of that could be a closed door. And I think we kind of do that the now. Yeah. Behind that is it only solves, for me, it only solves like part of the problem because you still have the the visual the email oh yeah text right. message. you still have your own distractions right yeah. but if you could put me in if i got to go write you know the ll or funds report and i got to go into that room and there's no connectivity and there's a door shut and it's quiet in there or i put a little music on like there is no distraction like right. there's no mm -hmm. way for me to be distracted yeah. i think that's the key is you remove it all completely so there's a version of that i've been doing that i've been really happy about i guess i'll share is one of my problems coming back to multitasking is when i'm on the phone with someone i'm not giving them my full attention mm -hmm. I am so bad at that. I am always, if the computer's on, I'll either continue to communicate on Teams or do something, you know, whether it's responding to someone on an email or, so Paul's seen this a lot. I just get up and walk out of that call room we had over there. Yeah. I just go sit and have a call over yeah, there. And that has been, I feel like my conversations with folks, and this is going to come back to a little bit of my book and what I've been trying to focus on with relationships and people. Um, but that has been a game changer because like, you know, I, I, unfortunately, you know, like I've had calls with Steve before and he'll say something. I'll be typing and he's like, what do you think? I'm like, do you mind repeating that? Yeah. yeah. Like, sorry, I just missed everything you just said. Yeah. You know, I was on this other thing. Do you mind repeating that? And so that's been really game changing for me is just get up and walk away from the machine. Go sit down in that great little room over there and, and take the call. I, I was in my cell phone. So yeah, and I've been doing the same where I sit on my on my little chair, chair there. Something just something to get away from the screen. Exactly. Yeah. 
And then I, they talk about that with your desktop, like trying to minimize your, your desktop and just clean it up and like either put yeah. it in folders or get it get it out of there and just put it all in one folder that says this is my stuff, you know? Yeah. They said just just I mean really the, and then open that up intentionally and then have your folder structure. You can probably combine the sleeper um, and this room into one really, because it's unlikely that you're ever gonna have those two aligned at the same time. For a a small, little, for a smaller look, room. as long as that sleep room's got a lava lamp, I'm good. Uh, then you're putting a screen in a sleep. Do you have, do you have point of exit? Don't do that. That's true. But when I'm recording a podcast, point. Like I can't be playing solitaire or doing anything because I have to listen to every single word they're saying right. in order to be able to respond or to ask the next I, question. I have to tell myself to do that. Like I have to like, I, I correct myself and I get mad at myself. Minutes, I'm, 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 I'm like, like this, like a, I mean, I'm like 30 minutes. That's all I got to do. Is I'm on a call and I pick up or I start typing. I'm like, stop doing that. Like it, I drive myself I'm crazy. Yeah, doing I drive it. my off. Yeah, that's a good way to do it too. I was like, you know, yeah. I'm. What am I doing here? Yeah. Now yeah. getting up and going to the room. There's lots of different ways. There's to lots of ways to handle it, so but that. Point is, yeah. Your point of your book is you got to figure out how you got to be mentally aware that you're being distracted in order to solve the problem. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Intentional about it, like you said. And then structure around, like he talked about structure around meetings. We don't. Fortunately, I mean, one of the best things that I've found at Nexus is you just, you, you know, you just work. There's not all this time you don't have meetings like all half the day time sucks and yeah you, there's not a lot of those yeah, really literally. and so yeah for, right so for meetings like having a, a specific agenda and then a brief about what you want to discuss and what you want to achieve like if you're going to set up a meeting then you need to have that to be able to yeah. do it and that makes it more intentional to set up the meeting if ask people like, that all the time yeah. somebody yeah. sent me about my book about that yeah somebody sent me a meeting invite without an agenda on it i'm not accepting that right but. I guess. Tell me what you want to do. In this yeah. Day. At a old old uh, project manager at Fleur as well as Larry Greer, uh, he'd walk in with a can of Coke and sit on the table. He said, "This meeting takes longer than it takes me to drink this can of Coke. It's too long. Yeah. Literally, drink his can <laughs> of Coke and throw it in the trash." Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. He did. It's and true, uh, yeah. Bill Gates writes a lot. There's a lot of authors that write about how to make more effective meetings, like long unnecessary meetings where you have 10 minutes of bsing at the front 10 minutes of bsing in the back 40 minutes when it should be 15 you mm -hmm. end up you just lose so it should be to resolve energy. an issue right yeah so you get in you resolve the issue you get out yeah set any action items and move on it shouldn't be a a, a power i mean you shouldn't just get around the table and start bullshitting you wait yeah. for it yeah. right and so that, that was one um hack back smartphones just made me think of what you were saying about he talks about the different ways to go in and set notifications that are important to you and optimize your notifications and if you're not using apps clean those out because it's just a distraction to everything else that you yeah. want to focus on um so going in and, and getting control over the notifications you really do need to see um as 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 an advantage to you um hack back your desktop what we talked about um online articles or feed you want to read later like put those in a folder for that 10 minutes that you were going to do something different and then be intentional about that distraction. That this is some, this is the time that I'm using yeah. to unwind or do something time different. block that rather right, than time block it. sporadically. And Mercury out. reader is great, but it'll take everything off your screen and just enlarge the article only. Mercury. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He mentioned some different resources Chrome for different it. apps that do. Uh, I read, I, I read, I read it full screen because I don't like the stuff around it. Too. Yeah. Is it too distracting? Yeah. I, I don't. <laughs> absolutely. And then he talks about the packs, and you're talking. You were talking about like locking your phone in, in, in the drawer. And so there, he talked about those as, as pack, different types of packs. You have um, effort packs, price packs for like the weight challenge. You put some money in, so there's something in. There's a price pack with that, and how if you set those uh, those boundaries with yourself, you're more likely to achieve those targets that you've set for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, the, just the power of pre-committing in one way or another is another way to really help you achieve those things. Um, all those uh, are probably key to the, the general discussion of what I thought as far as guides that maybe we could have guidelines around certain things or, yeah. you know, even like you said, maybe it's uh, just informing everyone on on ways to be less distracted at work. Mm -hmm. with you. Maybe it's a quiet room or, you know. Put your damn phone away in a meeting. What, like yeah, that. whatever. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No phones during meetings. Like, and he mentions that in here, just that depending cool. on the importance or like, I mean, most people know when to make a call or when. We're all guilty of it. When I'm, I'm, I'm texting right now. Doing it now, like in texting as we speak. Yeah. <laughs> well, there, there, there's an element in the reality of like, you know, I don't know if that's really 100 percent obtainable, but yeah, I mean, we also got do. kids, and oh, yeah. you got to kind of have some accessibility if they're sick at school or yeah. you know, 
No, for sure. I mean, yeah. there's boundaries, right? You can't go hardcore and be like, no but if you know, the phone, we're all like, adults here as you well, can right? You keep your phone not on silent. Like, chances are if there's an emergency or something, your wife's going to call you, right? Not text you or whatever, right. right? Most likely. So the idea is, is if it's a 30-minute meeting, then it needs to be a 30-minute meeting, not a 45-minute meeting. And if you know that there's not something that you're expecting or outside of an emergency, which hopefully it's a phone call anyway, is to try to, even if it's just that, yeah. right? It can still ring if necessary, but... Yeah, like my like I said, my hack right now is I just turn on things I really feel like I need on my watch, yeah. and I leave my phone in my pocket. Yeah, and when, when my watch vibrates, I take a quick look, and I can make a quick decision on that's good. Do I pull out my phone or not? And that's my hack right now. Yeah. And my most meetings, I don't ever have my phone out. I just glance at my watch real quick. And, and but there is that moment of distraction. I still will glance at my watch, yeah. right? It's not like you know, you, that, you've controlled that distraction. I mean, it's yeah. more about us gaining control over like what we want to see and really being mindful of that and not being able to control it and just having that all notifications like set you off and being distracted by those. There's things, there's good distractions and there's ones that are taking yeah, you away. A lot, a lot there's of traction is, and distraction. That's traction to what you, what's yeah. important to you. A lot of that circles around the things. concept of just being present with what you're doing. Whether yeah. it's writing the report or it's in a meeting or having a conversation is... The distract. If you're distracted and you're doing a million different things, you're not present in any one thing that you're doing. You're, right. You're thinking about one thing and doing another, or you're doing one thing while thinking about doing, well, kind of also doing a second thing. You're always, you're never really devoted and committed to whatever it is you're thinking or doing. And when right? you say it like that, it sounds so easy to do. Like it's, it's not. It's so second nature for us not. to do things like that. But I, I find myself getting distracted at different times. That's what kind of well, I like the idea. I like we intense, some but, sort of isolation room or some sort of. Like you said, like we keep one of the conference rooms for a phone room or something where people can go and it's like a place of no distraction. Well, with the expansion in Dallas, I mean, we're going to have a second conference room. We're going to expand that call room, yeah. small meeting room, yeah. and we're talking about a nap room. So I think we're going to have enough where – where is everybody? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Where is everyone? Am I here alone? <laughs> it's real quiet. <laughs> or even if we're doing the podcast one, maybe that's yep. – part of it because that's going to be used infrequently relative to when people record. yeah I mean, we can find a probably way to double up one of them or something basically but. soundproof this one room and then all quiet well, things we happen in the soundproof, soundproof room. a room for the podcast studio but leave it computer free where you can bring yours in when you need it but we could just or just have a desktop non only internet connected with no like admin and nexus pmg that doesn't have teams doesn't have email it's just where you can go to work and then save things on the sharepoint that's it yeah but anyway, those, those might be some good ideas to bring those two together. Yeah. Um, and then the last part um, that I got personal benefit out of was uh, how to raise indistractable children. And they talk about um, technology may not be really all that bad for kids. There's all these there's all these discussions about <laughs> depression and things like that. But it's really being being aware as a parent of how much time they're spending. And it's it's a creative outlet for them. And me and you had a discussion about yeah. this as well as it's it's a very creative world and it gets them to control. Like he talks about schools being like prisons, like there's an alarm on when kids have to go to the next class. They have to get a pass to go to the bathroom. Sometimes it's even more restricted than a prison for how much we're controlling kids and just kids actually have a freedom like they used to. Uh, they seem to be a big benefit to kids and they have that freedom in this technical world to go in and and do whatever they choose right but it's just how much focus are they putting into that and just being mindful of it as a parent and you know giving them boundaries and teaching them how to set their own boundaries and realize if, it, if it's a distraction or if it's gaining them traction on what they want to do and their values um so yeah. that gave me a, it really framed my perspective a little differently and made me feel more comfortable about um just the exposure because i agree with that um and it's more having the the tools to recognize and he didn't say anything that, that made me think, oh, my kids are in trouble or like five hours is too much. It's just the thought of if they're spending a lot of time on something else, I really need to be pay paying attention to them closer, yeah. no matter what it is, really. And just check in with them more often about how they're feeling and talk about those things and be more intentional. So it for me, the book was a lot about, um, I mean, the distraction element of it and how to how to motivate yourself to the traction items versus the distraction and use those things to your advantage. Um, it was more about being really intentional about the different triggers that you let come into your, into your life, into your family's life, setting those intentional times with them and being a trigger 
to follow up with them and say, now, you know, set those set points throughout your day of how you want to, how you want to frame your life. Like how, you know, from five o'clock to eight o'clock, what values can you live out in your life that, that are important to you? You know, um, so time blocking those things out and being intentional all around, I think was what I gathered mainly out of this book, but it was, it was a good read and Raj recommended. So I appreciate that. Yeah. Cool. You want to go next? Show me to go. I think my, both of our books will play off of each other really well. So either I was going to say, my, I actually think mine will feed yours better. Yeah. Relative to, you can apply a lot of those things to these types of people, if you will. <laughs> well, yeah. So what I'll actually do, because we both did handouts, <laughs> is, Nerds. and the way I staple is, if you went first, the first page of this will actually probably play well with the way you're pre going to present the the book. And then I'll I'll kind of layer in the rest of it. Um, so why don't you go first? Brian and are gonna share one. And mine will make more sense when I talk, but it, but at least it's a good it's a good kind of. I'm read. feeling a little bit distracted by these handouts. Going away. I'm having two. So I read a book called Surrounded by Idiots uh, by Thomas Erickson. Uh, it's actually one of the number one human behavior um, and communication books of all time. It's sold millions of copies. This book is uh, interesting. It basically categorizes four different types of human behavior and focuses on how to actually communicate with each and how each should, which ones function well together and which ones don't. So it kind of goes beyond the Myers Briggs and all that to define millions of different personality types and kind of actually simplifies it a little bit and tries to say there are really four different types of people. Now there are different classifications of those four different types of people, but generally speaking, you can kind of group people into four categories holistically. Uh, on this second page uh, in the thing, you can kind of see those four types of people and they do it by color, which makes it really easy to remember. The red, yellow, green, and blue. And the easiest way that um, to kind of summarize the book, which is really stated up here is, you know, we, we often get really frustrated with our coworkers here in this company and any company or even colleagues, your friends, your family, you can get very frustrated and you can either call them idiots or stupid or dumb or whatever, right? But the reality is, is oftentimes it's a communication barrier. In fact, most times it is. It's that there's an ineffective communication element to it. Um, so if somebody communicates differently than you and you're not receiving and sending the messages properly, it's not that each person is perceiving the person as an idiot or dumb or stupid is really just you're missing the points, right? So the idea here in this book is to try to improve interpersonal communication by understanding and being able to quickly identify what type of person you're dealing with to be able to work with that person in the effective way. And I know Paul and Roche and I have talked about this a lot, even with some of our colleagues, right? So there are four colors. And if you envision um, on here, it goes from red to blue, from left to right for all intents and purposes. And it's essentially the same equivalent of going from extrovert to introvert to some extent. Um, so one of the ways that I remember this is reds, um, yellows are the people that come up with inspiring ideas. Reds are the people that quickly make the decision, this is what we're gonna do. Greens are the people that do it and blues are the people that check the greens work. That's like the easiest way I remember who these types of people are, right? Um, I actually think uh, what the book talks about too is how yellows are really um, some of the most important relative to keeping a team glued together. They're almost like your carbon atom, right? They're like every, they kind of connect to everything to some extent. Um, and here you can see that they're your creative, optimistic social butterflies. They're the jovial people around the meeting. They're the people whose feelings get hurt at a party if they're hosting it. When If every single person there isn't having fun, they, they can't have fun. They're that type of person, right? Uh, red are true, like your bold and brash, ambitious, born leaders. They come in, they put their fists down, they say, "This is the direction we're going." But they're going to they're going to rely on the blues and greens to get it done. But they're going to establish the direction and they're going to iron fist their way through it. Uh, greens are very selfless, very relaxed. They're very loyal. They're the doers. They get stuff done. They feel very. They like to be disciplined. They like to work with yellows and reds and compliment them very well because they can. They feel inspired by a yellow to implement a vision and they go do so. Uh, and blues are like your your significant introverts. Um, they're very analytical. I think I, he was talking about a point in the book where he was basically saying like, if if you approach a blue without like a very detailed plan, they're going to ask you a thousand questions about your plan. And if you don't know it, they're not going to listen to you. 
Uh, right. So if a yellow or a red who's a visionary but doesn't like the details goes immediately to a blue, a blue is going to just be like this person has no idea what they're talking about. And you're never going to have an effective communication. So pitting a yellow and a blue together is never good. Right. I'll get into some more of that um, and how on the tips of these. Um, so that's like the general. And on the uh, on the third page, you can skip the next one. It's kind of summarize what I just said. But on this page with all the um, with all this, right, it really talks about the personality characteristics of the different colors. So you can see here the reds are typically some of the key ones are aggressive, they're strong will, they're very hard goal, goal, uh, goal oriented, uh, very, very decisive, controlling, powerful, results oriented. They like speed and intensity. Um, so if you really think about this, the best person that personifies a red in our world is Donald Trump. <laughs> no, the red is like someone like is like really boisterous, right? So one thing you guys should know is what I read is only 15% of people in the world from all the studies are actually one color. 80 or 85% are two and the very small amount of people are three colors. There is no such thing as four. You can't, it's not possible to have somebody who's a blue and a red at the same time, right? For example. Um, so most of us, and pretty much all of us, and I have, I actually wrote down notes on what I think the four of you guys are. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that if you're interested. But um, reds are definitely people that are that are this, right? Yellows are enthusiastic, talkative, creative, optimistic, social, um, you know, sensitive, encouraging. They like to communicate, very flexible, sociable, easygoing. They're your imagination. They're kind of your inspiring, creative guys who think differently and like to inspire ideas and bring together things. Your greens are people who are typically very patient. Uh, they're very loyal to, to their colleagues and their friends and family, very stable. They're modest, um, discreet. They're very good listeners. They're very productive, um, thoughtful, um, but they also conceal their feelings. Right, so they kind of keep things in a little bit and they're very kind and considerate. And then you've got the blues, which are kind of systematic. They're say, very distant. Uh, he actually says there, the blues can often be people in the room that want, don't even want you to know they're in the room, right? They like to be in the corner and kind of be just left to their own devices. They're very analytical, methodical in nature. Um, they follow rules, they're very logical, meticulous, and often reserved. Um, so you can kind of see the introvert to extrovert mentality there. On the negative side, right, that's the that's the positive qualities in their various ways. On the negative side, you've got reds that can be very pushy. They're very dominant. Um, they're very strict, almost overbearing a lot of times in, in, in certain environments and, and, you know, just over over dominant where to the point where it's it's a turn off to most of the people around. Um, on the yellow, the inspiring folks, they can be very manipulative, hot tempered, undisciplined, egotistic and counteractive. Um, on the greens, you know, the, the doers, if you will, can be very, very stubborn because if they're the ones doing it, they're very stubborn about how they're doing it. Um, they're very compliant. Um, they can be extremely dependent and very awkward. You can get a lot of socially awkward people in the green category. Uh, and on the blues, the negatives are they can be incredibly critical. So greens, blues are typically very critical of greens because greens are the people doing it. And the blues are going to be the guys that tell you you're not doing it exactly. You know, you didn't dot that T exactly or dot that I exactly the way it should have been dotted. It wasn't, it's not spaced properly, right? They're going to find they're so analytical in nature, um, but they can also be incredibly indecisive, which is why they need reds and blue, uh, yellows in their world. Um, and they can be a little bit narrow minded because they're so used to the meticulous way in which they do things. Right. Um, so those are some of the characteristics of these colors. Um, there's some additional stuff here on the core value side, but, um, some additional stuff that kind of, that talks about these people on the red side. Um, you know, the, the reds like to atten have a tendency to avoid involvement. So if you can think of anybody, our company who likes to come up with ideas, but don't want to do any work, that's a red characteristic, right? Uh, but like they, they want to come up, they have, but they want to avoid the involvement. You want to hold a meeting to talk about something. They're the guys that say, well, just go get it done without me and just let me know what the outcome was. That's a red, that's a red characteristic, right? A yellow, um, they look to the future. They're very visionary type folks. Um, they can be very, they can be impulsive, um, but they don't like isolation. They're the polar opposite from that perspective. They want to be in the room. They want groups. They want dynamics. They want a social interactions to come up with their ideas and they want people a big part of the characteristic is that is they want people to believe that they're, they want people to agree with their ideas before they ever would say this is the idea. And so that the red can be like, I like it, let's go, right? Make the decision. Um, your greens are going to be kind of your, 
Um, they don't they don't like conflict. So if you if a red approaches a green uh, and tries to like get really aggressive with a red, chances are that green's actually going to shell up and just you're not going to get anything out of that person. Um, you know they don't like change. Whereas reds and yellows do, the greens and blues do not like change. They're very systematic in nature. Um, and then if you go to the blues, right, we talked about a little bit about this a minute ago, but they, they hate involvement. They don't rather not be included in any meetings. They'd rather just sit in their office and be left to their own devices. Um, they're not interested in relationships. They're almost awkward and very difficult to have any personal conversations with. They feel very uncomfortable having those conversations. They'd rather just, just have work only conversation and specific even to the task and that's it. Um, but they're extremely organized. They are the most disciplined in here in terms of organization. <laughs> and I was, for the audience, I was staring at Brian. Um, so there are a, lot of the, a lot of the other documents in here are more of just kind of the, the words and some of the stuff that defines these people. But one of the things, I, so what I like, want to talk about is what I found interesting in the book, though, was um, how to identify these, these types of people. A lot of it's pretty easy i think for i mean i bet you guys have already thought about what we are around these tables right you can and then there's blends right and somebody's a red yellow or a yellow red they might be 60 40 70 30 etc but the, the real question the real thing i found interesting which was how do you know which of these groups work well together and should you have a red yellow green and blue always be on a team should it be a group full of yellows with a couple greens in meetings but what i found was that um you typically want initial meetings that have to do with a new client or new pro this is what i came out of a new project something to be led by a yellow you don't want to come right out the gates with a red running a meeting because they're basically just going to define the direction or the blues and the greens in the room are just going to not if they don't like the direction they're not going to say anything because they're such introverts and they're just going to do it and they're never going to speak their mind and the yellows are probably going to just get overrun by the red so you often don't want to have a red be in there to create the idea you want to take an idea to a red once you once the team of yellow, greens, and blues has figured it out, right? I don't want a red to create an idea? Reds can create ideas, but they will usually create those ideas and pass it on to yellows to foster the idea and get the team built around the idea to go back to the red. The hardest thing is- Look, I'm already good. In, in my head, I already kind of know I'm a yellow, just <laughs> after that, so I'm just trying to understand. Yeah, I no, got it's ideas good. of other people in the company. I find this really interesting, so. Like how does a yellow and a red work together is kind of my first question. So yellows, yellows and so yellows are the medium to protect the greens and blues from the reds in a weird way. So okay. a red will, so a yellow will actually, typically a red will go to a yellow for an idea, sometimes a green. But a yellow's job is to protect the greens and blues from a red because a red is so overbearingly dominant that the only mechanism to protect that the greens and blues to have any voice around that idea is the yellow. The hardest part is, is reds are really hard to deal with. And basically what it says is when you deal with a red, you actually need to go and punch them in the mouth. Is the, the verbal way is what he says. He goes, the rest thing you can do is challenge them and force them to, to be confronted the way that they are, because otherwise they don't respect you. If you go in and you're soft and they're just going to run right over you, right? So it doesn't mean you have to be an asshole, but you have to go firm and if you disagree with the red, you have to make it very clear and you have to say, you are not being respectful of the team. You have to go at them very disciplined in fashion. But for greens and blues, it's very difficult because they're inherently introverts. So yellows are really good conduits to reds to go back to them and say, the, you know, this is not happening. We're not doing this. You're being an ass. You're not doing these things. And that was actually the foundation of this book is this guy actually had a boss who was like the most hardcore red and it kept calling everybody in the company an idiot. Basically said, none of you know, any yeah, none of you know anything. I'm just surrounded by total idiots everywhere. And he was a yellow, the author, and he started learning. He's like, that doesn't make sense. Not everybody in this company can be an idiot. Why does he feel that way? And that's what inspired him to go off and spend his whole career and write this book and become a world-renowned author around it. Um, typically, you want um, typically another interaction that you want to see is um, greens are kind of like I said, your carbon. Like they're your, they can kind of mishmash everywhere um, they can be a really good tool for reds and for reds and yellows to implement ideas uh, and to push forward um, but you typically need blue the, one of the keys to business is having green and blues that actually work together well right the guys who check the work versus the guys who do it is really important um, the only hard part is is typically typically blues can challenge everything a green does and 
piss them off royally, right? It's like, hey, I just put this whole complex spreadsheet together. I spent a lot of time on it. And Blue's going to be like, oh, yeah, well, you Wrong. didn't round that to three. <laughs> yeah, you didn't round that to three decimal Three decimal places? places. Like, Who uses three decimal yeah, exactly. places? Like they get, and then it really frustrates the greens, right? And then what yeah. typically happens is they start bickering, and a red comes in and says, I don't give a shit. Get about what you're doing, just get it done. And the whole thing falls apart, right? And it blows up. And the yellow is going, hey, guys, everybody calm down. We need to get along. Let's do lessons learned. Let's do lessons learned. I've done that. <laughs> it, just, it doesn't work, right? It's all these weird. So one thing is, is trying to find the characteristics of the right blues and greens that work together and educating the, your blue people on how to better work with green-minded people relative to – you have to be willing to under, like to learn their point of view before you just challenge what they've done, right? Understand why they did something before you just challenge the work product itself. It's going to be a really good transition to my book. And so okay. the other part of this is finding the good, a good people who are green-blue balances. So when I was thinking about you guys. I actually think Paul is a really good green-blue. That's right. Uh, I, myself, I, where think. I think you are 70% blue or 70% green. Oh, I, was I actually think you're 70% green or 60, 40. I think you're actually a little more green than you probably think. It was my opinion. Uh, I think you've actually adapted over the years to be more green. <laughs> I was just thinking in my head up until we started Nexus, I was probably 90, 10 blue. Yeah. And with Nexus and your leadership is, and I think you've actually taken more green characteristics than blue like over the last seven years. Okay. So that's kind of where my head was at with you. I think you're a strong yellow yeah, red. Green. Oh, I actually I think too. he's a yellow red I green. Okay. I actually think he's a yeah. yellow red green. I think yeah. you're a rare. Yeah. He's pointing to me right well. now for those of you listening. I, agree, yeah. <laughs> I actually think you're one of the rare percentages that three. have three. Yeah, so uh, because probably. you're a very good doer. You're very much a, uh, um, an optimistic, creative person that wants everybody in the room to be happy. But you also have very... You have red tendencies. Yeah, I'm an asshole. And I actually, think, <laughs> I actually think, like Paul, those red tendencies have come out since Nexus was yeah. formed. Have come out. Yeah, I've yeah. become more. You've become more red since Nexus, just as he's become more green. Yeah. And John, yeah. Not necessarily always in a bad way, but you have more. You've become more of a natural born authority. leader in the way and authoritative in the way you pursue things than you were seven years ago, in my opinion. Interesting. Okay. Um, but you also have a strong yellow. So that's an actually very rare blend. You're a very rare person, right? Huh. Okay. Um, so yeah, so Brian, uh, I actually think you're a very strong green blue as well, but I think you're more blue green. I think you're really? the inverse of Paul. Okay. Uh, I think you're very you're very loyal. Mm -hmm. So that's why I think you have like it's probably like sixty forty versus sixty forty flip flop. Okay. But I think you're very detail oriented. Hence, <laughs> taking notes. Just take an example of this <laughs> book reading. Look at your book. Yeah. You have pages and pages of notes. You have folders in it yeah. color coded. Oh, kids, you're very that. structured. Yeah. You're very analytical and detail oriented, but you're also very loyal, very relaxed, and easy to get along with. So I think you're almost 50 50, but probably 60 40 uh, blue green. Um, and then for me, I actually think Raj is a really strong yellow green. Yeah. Yep. But probably like 90 yellow. Yeah. <laughs> so that's my view. I don't know if you guys agree, but you're very much a social butterfly. You're very in, much I, optimistic. I would put in 70, 30 yellow. Maybe, green. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. could argue 80, 20. Yeah, 80, you, look 30. At, you look at some of the green traits self control, reliable, composed, understanding. Yeah, hey, true. Yeah. He's yeah. one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, fair enough. But yeah, so you're very loyal. You're, but I don't think you have any red in your blood. Like you probably do maybe in certain parts, but very little, and I don't think you're a blue. I don't either. think I've ever seen any real red. I don't think I've ever seen any red out of you, and I don't think I've ever actually really seen any blue out of you. Um, and so, some so, maybe so tendencies here and there. It works really well in my relationship at home. Right? Because I, like, we should go to Chicago, and she like ticket price. Da, 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 yeah. Da, 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 da. No, that's perfect. They talk about relationships a lot here outside of just work relationship, but your personal relationships, right? So the one thing you guys could take away from this maybe is starting to really think about your relationships with your spouse, when you're with your children even, right? I don't have children, but you guys do. Like uh -huh. you can probably categorize your children. I know Roshan, you've said your your son and daughter are very different. Very different. I guarantee yeah. you're starting to form a view. I so am. learning how to react interact with them by these strengths and weaknesses is actually something you can tailor your interactions and your communication because kind of like what you said, Brian, like sometimes it's not, if they're distracted, it's a communication flaw sometimes, right? Because you're not understanding and you're not communicating effectively with them because maybe you don't really understand how they are yeah. or how they react. And, and Paul and Roche and I in the early years, and even when we were in Saudi, like we've learned over the years, what types of just naturally why we work together well is because I actually think Roshan me and you have a nice blend of these. We had a nice blend of yeah, these. Yeah, we do. If you really yeah. think about it, right? Yeah, yeah. You sat in here. So I kind of sat here. Yellow. Sat yeah, right. yellow. I had myself as a very strong yellow. Yeah, okay. uh, yellow with, with red. With some red and green, potentially, but maybe more red. More yellow-red was like 
Yeah, I was going to say you were kind of more yellow red. Yeah, yeah, I used to be more yellow green, I think. Yeah. When I was floor days, because I had to do so much. Yeah. Um, and I was very, I'm very loyal to my friends and my family. So but I, but even, even when we were at floor from a green, I would kind of provide this feedback. I don't think you really enjoyed ever really doing as much. No, I was more yellow. yellow. Like you did it because you had to. Yeah. Like I remember, I remember like you and I were like, no, nah, no big deal, man. Just give it to me. I'll take it out, right? Like I'll take it down for you. So like I think that was yeah. the green. In no, it. it's true. Like even even when you got frustrated with like an Excel file, or whatever, it's like, dude, I got it. I can do it in five minutes. Yeah. Like, I think that's the green in me. I think you were always more yellow red. It's just yeah, I think so. The way corporate works, right? That's fair. Get stuck doing green for thirty years. So that's before a really you can good, actually absolutely. thrive as a red. That's a really good segue for the final chapter in this book, which is most people in their natural world aren't allowed to be themselves. Yeah, I, they that's can't, good. They can't be themselves because of either the business environment or even their personal relationship with their spouse or whatever it may be. They always try. So if they're a blue, right, and they're married to a yellow, which is probably more closer green blue. It's kind of like how you and your wife are, right? If you find, if you find that you're, if you're forcing your wife into picking where to go, right? right she's not, it's not going to work very well, right. right? So it's finding that balance and actually making sure that you recognize these things and you set up their business or their personal environments to allow them to truly be effective in who they really are. So if you put me in a position where I have to be a blue green, like we were at Fleur, I'm not going to thrive there. Right. I'm going to be miserable because I'm naturally in this world. Right. So my takeaway from this, from a business perspective, and I don't think there's like a policy or procedures. Everyone around this room is a starting point can start thinking about how they really view from these categories, all of our colleagues and work colleagues and start slowly working with them to understand them more and more and actually position yourself and maybe even educating them in getting the best out of them with your relationship with those people by acknowledging these types of things. So did your book touch on approach to the different colors? Like yeah, how there's a whole approach to them effectively. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a, like two chapters at the end toward the end of the book. Um, and so some of this is, like I said, reds was, uh, was you got to go hard. Yeah. Right. So if you got someone who's really bold and they're like, I mean, this is literally like a pure red is very rare. It's like a Donald Trump. It's like someone who you can tell is like demonstratively hardcore in your face. Right. Like this guy's boss was like that. He was like, everybody's an idiot. Well, you got to just storm out of the room. Right. In a meeting sort of person. Uh, so you have to go hardcore at them with a yellow. Uh, we were talking about this earlier with a yellow. You have to be very emotional, methodically emotional with them. You have to appeal to them. You have to make them understand that their ideas are great. And if you disagree with them, you have to do it in such a way um, that you are not taking away their creativeness or their optimism. If you make them feel like you're bringing pessimism into their world, they're going to contract, right? So it's trying to flip flop your mentality around working with them to still inspire their creativity, make them feel like they own the idea, but help them through maybe tailoring that idea a little bit differently without saying this is dumb or this is stupid or yeah. like a blue and a green yellow don't work well because the blues will just be like, well, you haven't thought about this, 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 and this, and this, but the yellows don't do that. They rely on the blues to do that. You have to approach them and say, let me think about how this would work and I'll come back to you and we can think about a creative way to make this function, right? And they'll get all excited. Sounds like you're frustrated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that's why I wanted to go yeah. first because I actually this thought it was going to dovetail really well with my book. That's why I said because now you'll figure out it. <laughs> that's why I thought going first would be This good. is going to dovetail really well with my book. Um, with greens, they're very much about loyalty. That's probably the number one thing I read in this book is like greens are all about being loyal to their cause, to their spouses, to their work. So appealing to that loyalty is really important. Uh, making sure that they know you'll do anything for them. If it's a work task, making sure they know that if they, for example, if a green and a blue screw up some sort of Excel spreadsheet or a model and you're their boss and you're a yellow or red or even a green or a blue, taking the knife for them will earn a lot more trust with a green and they'll open up more than trying to throw them under the table. So we've all heard that phrase, right? Throw them under, throw the, them bus. under the bus. Mm -hmm. If you do that to a green or blue, it's way worse than throwing a red, a red under, throwing a red under the bus is a good thing. Yeah. They'll actually respect you for that. Throwing one of these guys under the bus, they're never going to talk to you again. You're yeah. never going to get anything, yeah. out, right? Yeah. Uh, with a blue, you have to approach them with methodically detailed plans. Everything is about finite planning and analytics and detail. So if I'm going to Paul and say, hey, let's go do X, Paul's likely with his blue characteristics and say, well, how are we going to get there? What time are we going to get there? Airport trip uh, to Philly. <laughs> what time are we calling the cab? What time? Who's who's ordering? We're gonna be downstairs exactly at so, six forty-five. <laughs> can't just go to someone that's a strong blue mentality and say we're gonna go do this without telling them we're gonna do it this time. This is who's gonna do it. This is how we're gonna do it. This is how we're going to 
meet you have to be you have to appeal to their detailed nature and they'll be more receptive to understanding your point of view so adapting to these types of people with those types of approaches is really a good way to get the most effective communication and the most out of these types of people you know it's interesting i don't see this model overlaid across cultures yeah or positions because cultures i mean you know you said 645 and there's no ish in there, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, IST. If you're not early, you're yeah, like, blues, like, blues hate ish. non-punctual people. Right. So, like if they tell you they're gonna be there at 6:45, they're gonna be there at 6:40. Yeah. And if you're there at 6:46, you don't respect my time. They, you don't respect yeah. their time, and yeah. they're just gonna keep. They're gonna tighten up, right? And they're not. You're not gonna. Well, we we have a term in our culture called IST, and I know that's kind of where your Indian standard time. So, <laughs> you tell people to be there at six, you just expect them to get there at eight, right? Yeah. Like. like we have a dinner <laughs> start time tomorrow at 7.30. No one's going to walk through the door before 9 o'clock. Yeah. Um, one thing that was really crazy. interesting, uh, especially if some of our colleagues that we know, um, yellows, really strong yellows tend to um, have no interest in routine or following systems and procedures. So This is why time boxing doesn't work for me. <laughs> yeah. So yellow to deal with, that was, this is one thing, because this is a characteristic I think that is in a lot of our people in our company, mm -hmm. is um, to deal with that, you have to, we talked about this a little bit earlier, but you have to deal to the emotional side of that, right? So going to somebody and saying, do your damn timesheet isn't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> yellow. Yeah, yellow, yeah. Um, going to somebody, going to that person and saying, hey, um, you're really, you know, this is really letting me down. This is a big part of what inspires me to do okay. my business. <laughs> yeah, you have to. Um, you're I know really it sounds have a business, but you're, you're really not doing your time. Yeah, you, it's really set an alarm. <laughs> <laughs> you appeal to their <laughs> hack back. Appeal to their sensitive nature. Right? Is, yeah, appeal to their sensitive nature. Let them know that not doing their time sheet isn't just, is something that's really important to you as a person, and that when they do it. It really makes you feel like the process and procedures that you put in place so are would be, important to you. Tim would be blue yellow then because you we had to appeal to him to do his timesheet and then he went and wrote a script. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which by the way was the most brilliant thing ever. Yeah. And then he puts a note that says this I is, did this with a I script. did this with a script and yeah, then I gotta print like that timesheet. Yeah. Which is I I love it. It makes me laugh every time. But it's interesting that there's a lot of yellows in our business. I yeah, there are. There yeah. Are. Um, cool. And so, oh, yellow tendencies. With, yellow tendencies. Which is heavy with entrepreneurs, right? I mean, it is. Most entrepreneurs. But, but it's a good point. Red. You have to blend that out as Almost well. Almost all entrepreneurs are some combination of yellow. Hmm. Red. Yeah. Because it takes that type of. It takes that vision. Like it would be pol politician as well, would be yellow. But yellows. Yellow yeah. red. Yep. But they don't get anywhere without blues and greens. Right. You cannot have a business with just red and yellows because all it'll be is a bunch of people punching each other in the face and crying <laughs> yeah. about their emotions. I like the negative uh, traits of yellows. Manipulative, hot-tempered, undisciplined, counteractive, and egotistic. I mean, it's, that's a list. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, that's a I will list. agree to that. Yeah, I mean, um, so for me, the book was really interesting for those that might want to listen to it or read it. It's, it's, more, it's not necessarily all about classifying, but it's about how to interact, communicate, and pair these groups. So the other thing I thought of when I read this in terms of a business perspective is we should really be thinking about this more when we put our teams together on projects. We should. We should yeah, I agree. We I don't think we should assign these to people. We should talk to people about what they think they are and what we think yeah, they are. Yeah, agree. And, and involve yeah. people and say, all right, in light of this, the way to deal with me is to bring me a plan and say, hey, yeah. let's go through this plan together and solve it together kind of thing, rather than yeah. walking in and saying, we're going to fucking do this kind of thing. So, yeah. yeah. Yellows and blues are the hard, by the way, yellows and blues are the hardest to get along. A yellow, a, a strong yellow blue, because yellows are just want a vision and blues want the details, and they, neither of them come together when it's just, Sorry, so you need about a couple of. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You need a green conduit almost in between, or you need a green blue to deal with a yellow yeah, yeah, yeah. like a strong yellow like 90 percent or more right yeah okay that's good that was really good um, uh, yeah it was really good. yeah it was a really good book um it's we actually really funny this. too like there's, there's definitely elements of myers briggs in here there is like, there's a lot of charisma in this book it's really funny you can learn some of these what color is my parachute it's a book called that yeah. similar mm. But so, yeah, I'll leave it at that. But like, like when you get frustrated with your colleague because you don't feel like you're on the same page, really take a step back and think like, am I communicating the right way with this person? Because chances are that you actually think the same thing and want the same result. You're just not communicating effectively because you think differently. And you've got to find a balance in how you communicate with those people that you don't, you're not feeling like you're getting there with. To me, this is a great like evaluation tool for employees to say, 
I think you're here. Okay, it's just where you want to be. Yeah. Like, do you want to be? Are you? you know, like, like our performance reviews. Yeah, no, I, I think this would be a great around idea. that. Quite frankly, I mean, we can be different. We don't have to do what we. Because no. I mean, we're going through the performance reviews, and it's pretty typical of like the everyone else's kind of industry standard. But this, this would give building you- it around this and understanding your employee population. Just so you guys know, I mean, you know, I'm in all kinds of other things, but one of the things um, I've been looking at doing with another friend outside of here is building a kind of a free Myers-Briggs type assessment that allows you to build teams and selfishly it was to implement something for Nexus so I've already effectively we could use it for free Mm -hmm. was the deal I structured and then it's a software development company I'm partnering with so it folds right into that idea of wouldn't it be great if we could get everyone to assess themselves and then we could create so teams around Myers Bridge. I didn't include it in here, but there's like a fifty set. There's like a fifty question quiz that essentially, cl- like, almost always classifies the perfect to perfect, like a Myers Bridge. Yeah. Yeah. But it's so way, maybe, maybe way we just maybe we could just do that, create a real simple web interface, but Nexus to take that and then right. I mean, classify the key it. Is is like if you look at someone like me at Fluor, right? A good example is, is I actually was good at perso- like perceiving myself as a good green blue because I could work in the details. I knew how to use spreadsheets and I could produce good looking reports and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, that's yeah. not who I was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's not that's who you are. It's what I had to do. Just totally because you have the be, yeah. just because you have the skill right. sets of one of these doesn't, doesn't make mean that's who you, you are. You have to kill a piece of yourself to be in that area. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I, so. I can I can be red if I want, but I hate it. Like yeah, yeah I hate. So like, we shouldn't put you in a position to have right, to be, right, right. Because right? yeah. you yeah. just that's not who you are, and you don't want that. Yeah, right? you can do it. That's, and it sh- it'll cool. eventually show well, through. You mentioned that, and so strong willed goal oriented. I think depending on where we are in our life and what we're doing in our life, what we're trying to focus or achieve. Yeah, we all have a little tendency of that. Right. right. We have certain goals, and you know. Yeah. There's, there's characteristics of all these right. that shine through some. Yeah. It, but it's more about like who are you predominantly, yeah, right? Yep. And it's interesting how it morphs. Like I think of my myself differently at work than I do at home. Like as I look at that, like my the way I am in my relationship and with my kids is very different than how I interact at work, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, it makes you think was like which ones, what, what which one really? are you really, right? And am I am I adapting myself to my environment versus staying there? And there's a that was one thing I actually found really interesting in this book to try to understand is like. Do you actually want to change yourself to deal with these people? Is that what I'm reading? Like, are you trying to basically be a chameleon? And it made it very clear in the beginning of the book, like, this isn't about making yourself a chameleon to try to be a different person with every single person. It's more about communication. It's like, a how do you get your yeah. message across to somebody so yeah. that they understand what you're trying to say? That right? could be a good segue to my book. Yeah, do it. Let's go. Um, so I read Never Split the Difference, and it's about um, – it's the author is Chris Voss, and so Chris Voss um, started his career as in in um, law enforcement as a SWAT officer, and then eventually migrated over into um, the FBI's negotiation um, team, and became basically the lead international kidnapping negotiator for um, the FBI, and so um, some really high profile negotiations that he's he was involved in. Um, a couple ones were the one in the Philippines where they had captured the the reporter, um, and then uh, there was the one the big Manhattan chase. Um, one of the first ones um, in New York was he was part of that as well. And then after leaving the FBI, he started the Black Swan Group, which is taking his negotiation skills that he learned in the FBI and applying them to business negotiations. And it's kind of interesting both in the book and he's also in the master class. So I've been it's been fun to read the book and watch a master class. In parallel, it's been they're, they kind of follow along the same, but they're a little bit different. Um, uh, but you know that original idea is like he thought he would have to adapt his negotiation um, from the FBI to the business world is one of the things he really talks about the book that's not really covered in the master class. But what he came to really find out is they're quite frankly the same. If not, it helped him really boil the fundamentals down even more simply to a few techniques and a few ideas. And the book is kind of that culmination of that background of high stakes negotiations when people's lives matter, coupled with these experiences from the Black Swan Group um, and negotiations that happen, in, you know, in a boardroom, if you will, and just those basic concepts. And where for me and, you know, the self-improvement, you know, I've been focusing a lot on being a hot tempered yellow. Now <laughs> It's kind of fun to play off of it. And um I thought this was a good one for me because just there's been a couple of incidents just within the company where 
you know, I had a blow up, I had, and it's like, okay, how do I get better? So that was kind of that starting point for me. And then as I got through this book, I think there's a lot just in the application of um, listening to the other side and how you can be better in your communication from both employee to employee, or it's not just all these, I'm going to approach a conversation less around, you know, getting the best deal, if you will, which is an element of this and how do you, and focus more on the tools and the things he talks about, right. In, in negotiation and try to apply those concepts to inter employee um, or in your own personal life on how do you apply these tools um, when you're having a conversation to help, you know, maybe reds and blues work together better. Right. And so I, g- I gave you guys a printout. It was kind of funny. I stapled them the other way. I actually wanted to talk about page two first, but it's really interesting. Maybe we talk about page one coming off of Ben because the way in his book, and I don't think this is actually addressed in the master class, which I know you went through. These, these are, these could be really interesting. There's three types of people you're ever going to really negotiate against, right? It's the assertive, the, the analyst, um, and the, um, the accommodator and each one like one of the things he talks about pretty deep in the book is not having any game plan when you walk in the room right and so i'm going to use some terms that i printed out on um page two it kind of defines certain things but this idea of back in the day you would go into a negotiation right and you kind of have your maximum price and you go tit for tat and it's a one for one and then you kind of end up somewhere in the middle is like historically this traditional. And he's like, that's just quite frankly bullshit. It's not like how real negotiations work. You should have no real game plan when you enter a negotiation or in this word, I think you can interchangeably use it with a conversation with anyone, with any other employee or even a client, right? You should have no preconceived notion of, you may know what you want to get out of it. But the, the big thing that I think the book starts out with and the master class really starts out with is this idea of tactical empathy. Right. And it's not that you're soft. Right. It's really the basic concept of putting yourself in the other person's seat and being empathetic to their point of view. Right. And then there's also um, a secondary piece, which is called force empathy. Right. So those are the two types of empathy that he talks about, both in the book and the master class. Right. Force empathy is you may not be really talking to someone that that has all the same techniques that you have sitting across the table from you. So force empathy is I'm going to make sure you hear in a very tactful way. I'll give, I'll talk about some of the tools that you understand from my point of view, right. As a yellow or, or as a red, why this is important to me. Why do we need these policies and procedures, right? On the flip side, the tactical empathy, which is again, how you should really start is let the other person really describe why or what is important to them. Right. And there's a couple of tools I'll talk about. How do you, have that conversation to get them to extract, um, not extract, but just have that conversation to to learn about their point of view. But coming off of Ben's red, yellow, blue, green, one of the big things you got to have to understand is the type of person you're talking to, right? And so to, it's, it's grabbing the reds, right? The assertive, um, again, I'm definitely, I know I'm a red, but like the red, yellow, but if you're you're having a conversation with a red, right? The red wants to be heard. And I'll talk about some of the tools and this idea of dynamic silence and that kind of stuff. But you, you have this printout, but I think one of the, the biggest thing is to deal with this type uh, first, re- first engage in reflective listening. So when you're dealing with a red, let them talk. And again, with tactical empathy is to really let them state their point of view first and really listen to what they're saying, right? And get as much out and understand from their point of view. And then there's mirroring and then there's labeling and you'll have those definitions in front of you. And I'll talk about them a little bit more, but then you can use those tools through that tactical empathy of letting them kind of talk. Right. So that's like the assertive. And there's a couple other things in the printout. That was the one big thing that I really is when you're dealing with an assertive and I'll talk about some of the other tools, really let them talk and then follow with questions that get them to talk more and really understand what's motivating them. Yeah, right. Because typically the more they talk, the more you learn that, that what you thought or what they even thought was really what they wanted really wasn't what they wanted to begin with. Right. In the negotiation. Exactly. You start learning from an assertive person really what they're truly after. And once you can hone in on what they're really after, then you can really start the negotiation. You're not even starting the negotiation with an assertive person until you actually understand and 
This is, don't come in with a game plan, right? Don't, you probably don't talk about it. I'm sure the techniques that allow you to get that information right. out of the third person. It's really interesting. Yeah, and I'll hit those again on when I get through these. I just think this is a good play on what you just came off. Yeah. So that's your assertive, right? Your analysts are your blues, right? Coming back to like tying the two books together, right? And the analyst is going to spend eight days, right? I don't know exactly what they said, but like they're going to spend a ginormous amount of time to know that they're fully informed. They've thought about the entire strategy, Right, they're going to have all of that laid out, right? To your point, if you come in with just like a bunch of talk into an analyst, they're just going to think you're an idiot, right? Like you're you're not well informed. They're actually going to shut down. So, to, so I'm just going to focus on how do you deal with that type of person, not go through everything you read through everything. Um, but to deal with this type, come prepared with data, facts, and information, right? And you may not know that. Sometimes you can tease it out of um, on a phone call. But if you know you're going to go face to face and have a discussion with an analyst type negotiator, right? And you can usually tell because they're going to be really detailed on the phone. They're going to kind of yeah. they're gonna get up all these facts. And numbers and percentages. and Right. So go to the table well-informed and be able to, you know, really substantiate or work with a blue on your team to help you prepare, right? Like, even if you are already... Bullshit. You can't bullshit this person, right? Right. You they're just going to shut down and... Like, I would be terrible at negotiating with an analyst right, right. at the gates, just my inherent self, because I'm going to say, you know, 60% of people do this. They're going to say, no, it's not. It's 38.6%. They're going to have the facts behind it, right? And right. immediately you're going to be discredited, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so the, the other thing when dealing with an analyst, and this is trying to understand, like, the um, – and this is one – and I kind of skipped it on the red, but red's easy, right? You create silence and they just keep talking, right? I'll talk about other tools. That's called dynamic silence or something like that. Um, but so with a red, you kind of ask a question and you create silence, right? Um, if you're a red like I am, and this is something I do, right? And you create dynamic silence. And I've actually caught myself doing this here recently, but then you're kind of negotiating or talking rather, having a conversation with an analyst. That, that dynamic silence may be way longer than you expected it to be. And then you as a red, which I am, may then talk again, right? <laughs> like 100% I've done that shit multiple times, right? I even caught myself doing it this morning on our 10 a.m. call. Ask a question. Silence is too damn long. I just kept talking, right? Like, like I, I, it's, 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 it's hard to implement yeah. these changes, right? When you do that to an analyst, they get pissed off. They're going to think, well, you just shut the fuck up and let me talk. Right. And let me let me organize my thoughts long enough to let me talk. Right. So being cognizant of that is important. And I'll just kind of go to the last one with the accommodator. And I think there's a version of Ben in the accommodator. I think you're a little bit both of an assertive and an accommodator in your negotiation style. Um, and I, I know there's others in the company that are 100 percent accommodator. But they the, the desire in that negotiation is really that that personal side, the need to be liked. Right. Um, and then to deal with this type, to be friendly, but be beware of getting stuck into small talk, right? Um, you know, their weakness is they don't always voice their objections. So like, I'm going to talk about the tools on how do you deploy tactical empathy in a second, but using these tools and deploying these tactical empathy um, to make sure that you give them enough of an opportunity to state, you know, what they're really feeling and not and making sure that that they're not a hundred percent kind of a yellow. Thing. What's that? yellow yeah that's yeah this they're very yellow. emotional they're very relationship driven yeah, yeah. that's what i think is right yellow. this is your red yellow this is why roshan noted that i'm more of the uh, sort of accommodator they have that's me tell. red yellow right dude there's a version how do you know, how do you know kind of ahead of time if you're going to meet someone new or it's a new, new negotiation so 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 you always this is really good transition i actually appreciate the question so what i'll do is move off of that first page and go back to uh the second page um and i'll just use these terms as i go but you, you start by deploying tactical empathy, right? So you, you, you always want to start he, – he talks and, – and I'll talk about the thing, but he actually gave an example of one guy that literally went into um, a networking event, and he didn't do any forced empathy, which is kind of telling your point of view. All he did was tactical empathy. So tactical empathy, there's basically two main strategies that you would deploy – um, to get that conversation started to figure out who you're dealing with, right? The first is called uh, mirroring. The second is called labeling. Now, there's other kind of ones he talks about, but those are the two ones that really stuck home with me and that they really drive home both in the master class. I've been the using the hell out of it lately. And I, I've been doing it more <laughs> too. And, and they really... They do work. It's crazy. They're, they're amazing, right? And, and you really, you, you do mirroring and labeling coupled with dynamic silence, right? And this is how it works, right? So you really start 
and they they all play well together. It's not like you just deploy one, but mirroring is basically you use you engaging in a conversation with someone, right? And you get them to to respond to whatever question, and you take the, the if you were to put it into a formula, and it's not a perfect formula, you take the last three words, and you uh, with tonality. You repeat those last three words in a upward inflection, so like a question, right? So you would say something along the lines of like, how was your weekend? Oh, we had a really great weekend. We went to the zoo, right? Mirroring would be you went to the zoo, right? And then you deploy um, naturally like dynamic stop. silence, right? Stop. You just stop. And you, employ, you, do, you just sit back and you employ, deploy dynamic silence. Now – a hardcore introvert may actually say nothing. Just say, yeah, I did. Yep, I did. <laughs> that was that type of response, right? There's these other things with open-ended calibrated questions, which I'll get to in a second. But calibrated questions, really, you try to deploy a little bit more with forced empathy, less with. But in this case, now you're going to try to get a little bit more forced empathy. So we'll get back to calibrated questions. But so it's kind of rare, though, that most people are just going to reply with, yeah. Great. Yeah, we went on Saturday and it was sunny out. You're gonna get then they're gonna start talking more, right? Right. And go ahead. I feel like what you're saying from here, some of it when I'm interviewing individuals, I feel very you do. Like all my questions have to be open ended. Yep. Yeah. Like you listen real carefully, like you don't hear a yes or no answer. So well, you you do a version of this on the podcast. I don't know if you do it. Or you realize you do it or not. You're like, well, that's really interesting. Which I know that kind of irritates you. You've talked about yeah, that, right. but but then you basically repeat the last thing they said. Yep. You know, it, which is effectively mirroring. And then it sounds like you say it a little bit different. If I heard you correctly, which we'll talk about that. That's actually not the best use of that. But but when you say they'll say, they'll come up with a really nice long winded statement or something on the podcast, right? What you do is effectively labeling at the end of that, which is you're taking all of that big, long thing and you package it up and say, if I heard you correctly, it sounds like you're saying you should network, right? And maybe it was, you know, and that, that labeling is, is the yeah. second strategy, which the is. The most common labeling phrases are it sounds like and it feels like. Yeah. Right? And you don't want to, but you don't want to inflect yourself into that. No. It, and so you do do that on the podcast, right? You say, if I heard you correctly, take, take that out and it's. It sounds like, uh, based on based on what you said, you want to put it on tactical empathy, right? On on from what you said, um, and so that that those two techniques of labeling and mirroring with those questions and putting them into a box and letting them redefine, and you don't even have to label them correctly. Which you've actually done it where you actually mislabeled something and then they corrected you. The game, it's not the game, but the the point of all of this is to get them really when you're deploying tactical empathy to for you to really ask these questions to understand their perspective life through their lens right so if you're talking about blues and greens and yellows if if everyone just approached a conversation with this tactical empathy and you start the conversation with really tell me why this is important to you right and you're deploying labeling mirroring tactical empathy and so silence one of the most powerful i remember he says this one of the most power so when you start any negotiation right you're almost starting out with 50 percent odds to either direction one they're gonna they're gonna either come in and bulldoze and tell you we're not doing this deal unless it's X or they're going to do the opposite, which is let's work toward, you know, let's work toward a deal. Obviously the former is not something that you want to get into that battle right away. So one of the best tactical empathy approaches is if you, you always want to start a negotiation with saying something like, you know, Hey, we're really excited to be here with you guys today. In our opinion, if both companies don't come out of this negotiation, is feeling like they've won, then it's not something we should really approach. Like this is not a win for us or whatever, right? And we're really looking forward to this partnership and the opportunity for our teams to work. If they were coming, planning to come in and just hit you in the mouth with their negotiation, you've immediately taken that away from them. Because what are they going to do now? Oh, you guys are a bunch of assholes, right? After you've just talked about how warm you want to be to their partnership, right? And that's a good use of tactical empathy right out the gates because you're immediately taking away half their argument. And if they were, you're disarming, if they were planning to do that, now they're on their heels and they probably don't know how to react and you're going to be able to move easier. Move, move the needle. And there's a version of that too. Um, and it's actually defined here called accu accusation audit. And I actually do this a lot, just something I always do, but I always like start with like, look, I know I'm an asshole, right? But, but I've, I've just always done that naturally because I, I found that it works in my conversations. Like I know I'm an aggressive person. I, I've always known that. And a couple of years ago, I realized if I start by just saying, look, I know you guys may think I'm an asshole, 
right? But I, I really do mean well, you know, and that is effectively a defined strategy. I didn't even know it. It's yeah. something I started doing a couple of years ago because I, I found I it does disarm it. the other side. It does, yeah. I do it a lot. I never realized it until I took this master class that it's actually a tactic. Yeah. But you, you, you probably don't even realize you guys all do it at some point per- point in time even when your own personal relationships right like i don't mean this to sound bad or i don't mean this disrespectful or please don't take this the wrong way those are all accusation audits right because you're setting them up so that they don't feel like you're it's the communication it goes back to communication you're not allowing them to perceive what you're saying the way that it's not intended to be meant that's what an accusation audit is you're setting it up so that they know so yeah exactly so the you know but and then so the the there is one big thing that I'll layer into this, into the conversation that's probably really worth addressing in that, and, and there's actually two pieces of it. Um, one is the I can't remember, 738.55 rule, which I'll talk about in a second. And this is a big thing of what I've been talking a lot about um, here recently, definitely amongst the, the three of us, uh, Ben and Paul, but uh, vo- and voice is the other piece of that. And so I'll, I'll touch on voice real quick, but uh, there's basically kind of, three ways that you want to have a conversation, but like smiling and um, the playful accommodating voice, the, you know, like opening a meeting, whether, you know, from like a, we want to have, you know, we want to do this together. Like that, that playful, happier voice. That's how he helps. starts the podcast. He does There's something interesting about yourself. Right. right. Exactly. Off onto a jovial light footed mentality. Right. Exactly. Then there's the, the calming voice as well. So there's a playful voice, right? Like it, the late night DJ voice. <laughs> And so that late night DJ voice, is, as it's starting to get heating, and he talks a lot about like high stakes negotiations, right? And he actually played on the master class, which isn't in the book. I thought one was just the absolute brilliant one, the one that the, the Chase Manhattan. Yeah, with Chase Manhattan bank robbery. And he had to step in for another negotiator, right? And like he basically, this is like the perfect example of the late night DJ voice. Is like, um, it, and it's actually late night DJ voice with assertiveness, where hi, this is Chris. You're now talking to me like that real DJ voice. And it's actually the assertive is with a downward inflection. Right. And you don't want to always implement assertive, but when you do, you better be like, like he said, like if there's a make or break CP in a contract for a business perspective, you're going to want to do this calming voice with a real assertive, uh, you know, downtone, but it, that DJ voice kind of keeps it calm, but the assertiveness is I'm firm on this. I'm not moving. Right. And it kind of calms the situation down, right? You can also do it with an upward inflection, right? The late night DJ voice. But the point is there's the playful voice and then there's that calming. I know we might have an issue here, but, you know, like to, to kind of play with that voice a little bit. Um, so that, does that kind of, yeah. So the, the, it's really, I mean, it's really easy. Like it's hard to sh- show and tell you, like you, you can watch it on one of ours. We have subscriptions, but like the master class is absolutely brilliant. Yeah. I, I highly, highly recommend you you watch it. It is really cool and okay. really entertaining to see. They flash back to his like bank, like high state. He did like the Oklahoma City bombing negotiations. Yeah, like super high profile ones. And then he does real live negotiations where he brings in like a highly trained actress and says, "You need to try to beat me in this negotiation." And it is absolutely the, the one that. The one that made my pop barrel rotor, and the one the one about um, it was sixty seconds or she dies. That's yeah. how he opens it up. I was like, holy shit! My, my favorite one was where he says, um, "You're my boss. You're uh, an employer, and I'm interviewing, or I'm an p- employee, and I want a raise. And your job is to convince me that you're not going to give me that raise." By the end of the time he finishes negotiation, she actually gave him more of a raise than he originally asked for. <laughs> yeah, and she and it was you know she's a trained actress and stuff, but like. The way he did it and he deployed all these techniques and the DJ voice, by the time she finished, she was convinced that she won the negotiation. Yeah. That she felt like giving him a raise was the best thing for the company. It was absolutely spectacular. It was really cool. Um, and, and, you know, so on the force empathy side, you know, when you're kind of um, – when, when you're kind of starting to give your point of view and then you're getting, you're getting comments back on your point of view um, – Calibrated questions are the best kind of way to co- come back, right? So, you know, the, the, the best one that really stuck out, maybe not so much from an employee standpoint, but from a true negotiation standpoint is when the, the, the at some point cost always comes up, right? And someone's always going to come up with some crazy low ball that's just like, 
like it's like it's not even worth talking about right and like the the one that really stuck out with me that i i think i'm going to try to implement at some point you know when someone comes back with some crazy like rebuttal on pricing is how am i supposed to do that right like that calibrated question is it's open ended as hell right and it puts them back in the driver's seat on the person on the other end to have to actually answer it mm -hmm. now you may get a i don't know and at that point you're dealing with someone right so you're going to have to then probably deploy labeling right so it sounds like i didn't do a good job presenting my my point of view right maybe it sounds like i didn't articulate what i'm trying to accomplish well enough so maybe we should go back over that right but 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 at some it point it sounds like you're you can do both you can do a calibrated question with an accusation on it so you can do it it sounds like you're not really too concerned about whether or not i can actually meet my obligations in this contract through, by having enough capital to to support what you actually really need for me. It's the empathy, it's all tied together, right? You can force them into a position where they're empathetic to you, but you also make them feel like, I can't even deliver what you really want if we're not willing to get closer here to the middle, right? Yeah. And so it's, a, it's and you can do it in such a way that it's not like, you know, screw you, right? I can't deal with that price. And, and we're, I've been guilty of that in the past, yeah. right? You guys are crazy. You guys are crazy. Like how much you, you know, yeah. that's really not the right way to do it. We're surrounded by idiots. Well, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think we've experienced that a lot recently, right? Where we've dealing with an assertive on the other side of the table, and they're like, "I want it for this price on this schedule for this scope." Of work. And it's like, "Well, we can't do that. So let's figure out here's what we can do. And if it's not us, then it's not us." Yeah. And we kind of just put it back on them to the, to say, "Here's why we can't do it. Tell us how we can do it, or it's we can't do it." Like, but I think I think you know, implementing the calibrated questions and all of us kind of. I think that's a better way to do it than what we've been doing. Another way, example, yeah. another good example they use is like if you if you're delivering, like let's take a merge, right? If you're delivering a really high value and they ask for a price cut or they tell you you're too expensive, you say, "Sounds like you don't really truly believe that you're getting the value out of what we're doing, right?" You change it from a price concept to a value. Do you not really think we're doing a good job? Because if they say, well, "No, you guys are doing a great job," well, it sounds like then you agree that oh, we're, you know uh -huh. we should be paid appropriately for that great job. Like you flip it on its head, right? You turn it into value. A value-loaded question slash mirroring technique, yeah. and it's, and even it's with really just about getting them to think differently about what they're even trying to ask you. Mm -hmm. and, and for me, the big thing is like this team dynamic, right? Like I know you guys all know it's been a big part of what I've just been like thinking about and focusing on, and and that you know for being a yellow red for me, you know it, it's it's difficult, but like the tactical empathy chapter is the one that really stuck home with me. The one that I'm trying to do a lot more of is really trying to listen. And understand and I know you guys and I'm being a little bit critical sometimes of our own but I think it's good to be critical um, and try to kind of send that seat I know that's been a big pivot point on for myself personally from a growth perspective and I think for all of us to try to deploy more tactical empathy when having conversations with other people in the company is probably my biggest takeaway and one I'm trying to live with right now and like really implement it's hard though it's really hard. Like it's so easy well, to slip back in your. It plays off of Brian's con book's concept too, which is that most of the time, you're in a negotiation, even with your wife. It, negotiation yeah. isn't just a business yeah. transaction, right? Like if your wife asks you to go to the grocery store, you're in a negotiation. Yeah. Right? There's you have hundreds of go negotiations every day. Your kids ask you, "Mom, can I have a lollipop?" You're in a negotiation immediately, right? You're you're having these, right? But most of the time, people don't understand that a they're in one. And B, uh, to Roshan's point, what you know, learning these things, which is one probably one of the biggest takeaways from a business perspective, is you usually don't really know why the, what the person really truly wants. What they're asking you for is actually like your book is driven by something else. So if they're on their if they're doing something else and they're distracted, it's because there's an underlying theme to it, right? There's something else going on. And we've talked about that many times with some of our colleagues. We're like, there's got to be something more to it. This yeah. doesn't make sense, right? So challenging yourself to really get to know. What's really motivating the person to ask for what they're asking for? If they're asking for a pay rise and they're being demonstrative about it, is it really the is it really the money? Is there something more? Is there something going on that you need to understand better? Are they just not happy? Whatever it is, you got to get to the root. And that's these tactics are designed to get the person talking so that you can finally figure out what's really what it is that really they want, and then you start negotiating. Right. 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 Was, and it's not always about the deal, right? To your point, yeah. negotiation. A, a, a negotiation isn't the win or lose. Both parties should feel like they successfully came to an arrangement where everybody's happy yeah. with the outcome. It's yeah. not about winning or losing. Sorry, Sorry, what, about, what about where everybody loses? Because that's been asked 
fairly comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> and nobody wins. Yeah. yeah. And it's, it's, just, it's not a good deal, right? Yeah. So that's our job to, to <laughs> fix that. So in parenting, I tell my wife all the time, you know, kids want something, say, look, their reasons, not our reasons. But what are their reasons first? Mm -hmm. And then try to convince them to do the stuff we want them to do for their reasons. Yeah, that makes sense. So I want, I want to close on, because I've given this a lot of thought, and this is something I know you guys know that I'm becoming very passionate about. But the last thing I want to close with and, and really tie it back to the company outside of how do you have conversations with people in the company is the 73855 rule. Um, and I'll just read it here. Um, uh, in interpersonal communication, people convey 7% of what they really mean through spoken words. 38% through tone of voice and 55% through body language. And I know in your book, yeah, I was just about to say that when you have, well, like when a yellow has something or a red, I can't remember. It has something to say. You and I talked about this briefly when I'm listening, I sit back. Yeah. Right. And when I'm trying to make a statement or purpose, like I just did, I'll sit forward. Right. And that this was done a whole bunch of research. I can't remember it. He didn't come up with this concept. It was referenced from another book, but there's a bunch of science and research behind it. But one of the things I know I'm becoming more and more passionate about as our company grows and we're spread out, and I know RL is becoming passionate about it, is we need to get better at implementing video calls. Yeah. And just in-person meetings. In-person meetings. And, and I know like we've even talked about like the overhead budget for putting people on a plane to go to Greenville to have and build that because the reality is, you know, Okay, you're on a phone with someone and you can hear a little bit of their tone of voice and what they're saying. But unless you really have that face to face conversation with them and you can watch your body language you only, now, you're only getting seven percent. Yeah. yeah. Seven plus, like, it's the 38 on the Sometimes spoken. You can hear some of the tone. You're missing half of the conversation by not being able to see them. There's a lot. I didn't talk about it as much. There's a lot in this book about body language. But, but it was kind of obvious when we were talking. Yeah, about clearly. I talk, I'm sure one of the things is I talk with my hands, right? I'm here waving my you're hands like, You're like the wacky, flatable arm. <laughs> I'm the like, yeah. yeah. But, you know, like, I, and I think that's really important. We got to keep driving that home as a company, right? This last company call by implementing the video was so much better. I've gotten so much feedback from everyone. Like, it's more who we are. It was great to see everyone's faces. It, like, that is a prime so example. It was more jovial. It was le and I think that's a prime example of an easy win. The other thing is, we really do have teams. We have cameras on our, you know, we yeah. have we we need to figure out how to encourage. And this was RL's big passion with buying that owl unit. I know we're getting one for Dallas, but encouraging people to do the less easier thing, which is just hit them up on teams. Cause it only gets worse when you're on teams. Mm -hmm. There's so much lost. And you know, I am typing so fast, like half the time I got to go back and like, I'm not even rereading my stuff. Like getting on a video call, I think is really going to both enhance the, the team dynamic of the company, but also help conversations. Cause that other 50% and being able to see each other is going to be a big part of how we grow and collaborate across all of these divisions, offices, groups that we're forming, especially for how fast we're growing, right? Like if I got a question for Sam, who I still haven't met yet, like I should really make a point. It's, it's a little bit more, you know, to open up my laptop, use my camera, but I should make a point and be like, hey, let's video chat real quick, right? Yeah. And that's that, that little bit to be able for us to see each other is a big, big part of, of his point on, you gotta get into the room, right? That was one of the things that like, it was one of the hardest things that he talked about with over the phone negotiation is not being able to see the hostage taker and the kidnapper, right? Right. And getting eyes on him is a big part of what like he talked about in the book, right? Getting eyes on the kidnapper. He's like, that whole thing is getting into a room in a boardroom, which is a lot easier, right? Getting in front of your clients, right? And then having that face to face. So yeah, it's great to kind of get started on the phone, but your calibrated questions or your open ended questions is what it would it take for, you know, for us to meet and you know over a cup of coffee or you know we would love to come to you know come and meet you and kind of present who we are and and for us as a company as as, as inner employee interpersonal skills i think that the easy low-hanging fruit is doing more video chats yeah, and that that's kind of the one big takeaway after i read all of this and the great tools and everything is we need to see each other more okay. I like it. 
sounds like you'd like to get together over the weekend. I would. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like I really like coffee. <laughs> Who wants to have coffee at 2 p.m.? <laughs> Not allowed. It'll impact your sleep. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Awesome. That was a good one. All right. All right. What's next? Yeah. That's oh, fun. yeah. We got to I don't know what we do. On the I next. picked the last two, so somebody else suggests something. It's not very red of you. I know. <laughs> Link to my yellow side. Um, I don't know. Maybe we, and we can table it and just think about nope, it over the weekend. Do it now, because I got to start reading. Why don't we come back with a full plan on Monday? And uh, <laughs> <laughs> you're clearly not prepared for this. Oh, like you'd really like to think through this a little bit. <laughs> Maybe I would. Um, yeah, we can think about it. Let's think about it a little bit. I mean, one one of the things I want to throw geopolitics out there. Geopolitics. Yeah. Because I think it, it affects our industry too. Mm -hmm. From an energy perspective, as things change in the next decade, what that looks like. Um, if if things currently if things go as they currently are, then there's certain parts of the world that are going to lose control over the natural resources. Mm -hmm. How's that going to affect going to be vacuums in the industry? Who is going to get real philosophical in that perspective? Yeah. Cool. I like that. Man, I like geopolitical. I don't know. I don't know if that one's going to get published, but <laughs> from a you get kind of weird, but yeah, yeah, I think that's a good idea. What kind of angle do we want to? Is there a specific angle you're thinking or want to do from a, specifically to business, so I can like hone in? Yeah. So I mean, energy, right? like how our business like, needs to adapt to deal with potential likely future geopolitical risks, maybe. Right. So, so from an energy perspective, um, you know, like Middle East right now sits on a lot of oil, right? And the next decade potentially they're going to use it, lose a huge source of revenue. So, what does that look like in the world going forward? How's that? Perhaps benefit us, doesn't benefit us. What does it look like? Okay. So that's what I was thinking. Of course. That could be a good one. I mean, I'll put those just suggestions too, though. Yeah, the only other one, I, the only other one I had, which maybe we do it the one after that, was maybe to do one like on, like true, like sustainability initiatives. Like I read a, a book a couple months ago on, um, like plastics, just in general, like what. You know what are plastics really like? How are, how are they actually recycled? Like what do they really do? What is it really made of? And just educating. Like we could do something on like sustainable. I reread the uh, responsible company. Huh? Uh, the Patagonia book. Yeah, was, I, I read that one. That was good. But anyway, we can do that one. Maybe this this next one after that. So we'll have two lined up. Cool. Get a little bit technical. Yeah, it was like uh, the one I read was called like bottled, and it was basically just all about the bottled water industry and like, how it really functions, how it got. It's really fascinating. It's all about like. Bottled water, and most of the time, it's not even really any cleaner than like tap water. And like, what happens to the bottles? Like, where the plastic's actually made from is actually like hurting the water itself. It's really interesting, but like topics like that can be really interesting. Mm -hmm. They'd say glass is making a comeback. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. So, all right, cool. cool. Let's do it. <laughs>